Hi, everybody. JJ here, back again for another ASUS PC DIY hardware stream. And uh, hopefully everybody is having a good Friday and getting ready to wrap up the week on a positive, productive footing. Uh, we've got a lot of different things to talk about. We're going to go ahead and see. We've got a lot of people here joining us here on the stream. So we've got uh, Michael. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here. Happy to have you here, man. Um, let's see who else we've got here. We've got Ben. Always great to have you here. Uh, H2O Computers, man, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Paul, uh, joining us all the way from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Very, very cool. Um, we've got Sue Min. Thanks also for joining us here as well. We've got uh, Tank Tankerus. <laughs> uh, how you doing, man? Happy to have you here as well. Um, MUFC14, thanks for joining us as well. Uh, Erica, always great to have you here. Thanks for letting us know. Audio sounds good. And Snef, uh, always great to have uh, one of the absolute best builders and modders in the game. Oh, happy Canada today. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, happy to our friends in the great north and over in Canada. Uh, if you guys don't know, Snef is a, a Canadian. Um, fantastic set of users there. And we've got a lot of Canadians that are PCDOI enthusiasts. So uh, very cool. Happy Canada today. Um, so thanks so much for joining us here. We've got a lot of things to be able to dive into. We're going to be talking about actually quite a number of new kind of products that we're going to be releasing to the market. Market. So we've got everything from the brand new Noctua 3080 edition graphics card which we announced previously we're going to give you some information in terms of the pricing and the availability uh, we've got a new update in terms of a b550 prime series based motherboard we've got a be series monitor which is actually pretty cool for those of you that are looking to maybe integrate an actual webcam along with a monitor experience along with some other cool uh, functionality a little bit of a kind of a sidebar product where uh, a lot of people i know don't necessarily right now use optical media but if maybe you're looking for an easy and kind of low cost long-term storage solution we've actually got an update to our optical drive and external low-cost uh, optical drive solution. We're also uh, got some new giveaways, including an actual ROG Evangelion full system giveaway that we're going to be talking about, which is also pretty sweet. Uh, UEFI BIOS announcements, and then actually some cool stuff to actually talk about in terms of DDR5. If you guys actually saw a recent post that I went ahead and put up earlier today, um, we're going to go into get into a little bit more information about understanding, I think, some of the specifics um, behind DDR5. We'll actually have more content uh, coming in the not too distant future where we're actually going to have some conversations with some great partners like Micron with Kingston, helping you guys have a greater understanding of actually DDR5, some of its more technical kind of specification aspects, um, as well as kind of where we're going to be going with DDR5. And so I think it's going to be some cool, interesting opportunities uh, for you guys to not only get some more information, but make sure to actually join, join us for those uh, streams and for those videos, because we'll actually have some giveaway opportunities, which will be pretty cool as well. So all the way around, some cool stuff going on. So uh, let's go ahead and get ready to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, hey, uh, Victor, uh, happy to have you here, man. Thanks so much for joining us here uh, for the stream. All right. So I think first and foremost, let's get ready to go ahead and touch on uh, just some general UEFI BIOS announcements. Um, I'm literally, I haven't even had the chance to take a look at the uh, full sheet today. So you're going to go ahead and find out with me literally at the same time. Uh, these actual round of updates. But let me go ahead and bring these up and I will let you know. I will have the UEFI BIOS announcement posted a little bit later today within the PCDIY group. So if you guys are not part of our group, it's essentially a great community that we have. I will link it in the chat. Um, you know, over th almost 35,000 members where we've got just a uh, fellow set of, you know, PCDIY enthusiasts that you can go ahead and ask questions, share, uh, you know, your build experience and so much more regarding. So let's go ahead and uh, see what we've got on tap for today's UEFI announcements. So go ahead and just bring this up here. All right, here we go. And let's see what we got going on. Okay, so for UEFI updates, let's see, um, looks like we've got X299, actually, that's pretty interesting. We uh, X299 is a pretty mature series of based uh, boards. So, um, you know, generally what I would mean by mature, if you're kind of wondering about is it generally after I'd say about mm, 12 to about 16 months, boards really reach a kind of very high level of maturity. So usually you don't see additional updates unless they might be specifically for maybe a new uh, feature introduction, maybe a security patch update, um, maybe a specific kind of feature update, um, or maybe something very large scale. So take, for instance, like one of the last updates that was released for X299 was when uh, things like resizable bar or Windows 11 uh, GPT compliance was enabled within that UEFI. But even before that, it was pretty much a very mature base UEFI. So it wasn't necessarily something you would have to kind of consistently be updating to be able to ensure the overall best experience. Uh, but actually quite a number. If I look at the list here, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
probably close to almost 15 uh, boards uh, under the X299 lineup that actually did receive a UEFI update. So let's go ahead and just for reference, show you guys what that looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and bring it up for one of these boards. So give me one second here and uh, we will open it up for one of these boards. And as always, if you guys kind of want more insight regarding um, you know, questions on whether or not you should update your UEFI, uh, when we do actually put the post up in the PCDIY group, there's an actual FAQ doc that I've written. Um, I do recommend actually reading through it. It's got a lot of good information that helps you to kind of understand whether or not you may want to update, especially when we update the UEFI, there can be changes in what are called the auto rules. The auto rules are the base firmware that is defined for the UEFI BIOS. And if you have maybe especially kind of overclock configuration uh, where you fine tune kind of different things like memory parameters, certain turbo ratios, when you change those underlying auto rules, you can actually affect the stability of that. So you might not expect it, but going from one build to another build, even though the builds are quote unquote stable, you could actually have instability because maybe base auto rules that the kind of tuning was based on have changed. And this might mean that you'd actually have to go back and retune the overclock. It doesn't mean the UEFI is broken or it doesn't work. It's because because we've changed certain underlying auto rules. And so this is an important thing to kind of understand. There can also be other things like uh, RAID interoperability if uh, the option ROM gets updated and there's kind of other factors. So there's actually a lot of things within that FAQ that I always recommend that you kind of read through. So um, let's go ahead and take a look here at one of the boards that did get an update. For instance, this is here. This is the ROG Strix X299. Uh, XE. So this was an updated version, uh, not the original launch version, but um, like I said, there's quite a number of boards that did get the update. You would head over to the UEFI tab. And then from there, you'll actually see right there, yep, 628. So it was a little bit earlier this week. And you can see that we went ahead and actually made some enhancements to things like memory compatibility and uh, and things along those lines. So you would just go through the actual update process. So I will have the full list in uh, the actual PCDIY group posted as feature announcement. But since you guys are checking out the stream right now, I'm going to go ahead and just drop in all the boards uh, that did get an update. So let me go ahead and just drop that in there. And if you guys are interested, you can check it out there. So give me one second to go ahead and uh, open these up here. And we'll double check to see if we got any questions right there, too. OK, got that settled there. OK, great. <laughs> Hey, uh, DDA40X Bruce, uh, happy to have you here on the stream. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, so that should be the full range of boards along with the actual UEFI builds. I've gone ahead and linked it in the chat there for you guys if anybody is interested. So you guys can check that information out. So let's go ahead and see if we have any good questions there. Uh, OK, looks like we're OK, so no worries on that side. Uh, looks like we got a question right here. Uh, let me see right here. Do you have any news about the new ROG case? Is it worth it to wait uh, for this as far as a replacement? So it's important to understand that right now, I can't give you all the information, but I can tell you a couple of things. One, the G GX601, which is the current ROG Helios, uh, we don't plan to EOL, so essentially end of life that. The upcoming EATX kind of uh, chassis that we're designing and developing, which you can take a look at a preview of it in the uh, ROG Citadel application, which you can download in Steam, is essentially an evolution of the Helio. So um, it has a very different kind of design. It's being tailored to even kind of be more suited, I think, to even higher end kind of water cooled configurations. And that chassis is still under design and development as of right now. Potentially, we may be looking to release it maybe towards the very end of this year, but it could potentially maybe run into the beginning of next year. Right now, it's always a little bit of a challenge when it comes to things uh, like the production of these more specialized chassis because we're not taking um, just, you know, the same chassis and just making a small adjustment. There is some quite extensive level of redesign uh, that is going into the design and development of this chassis. So it won't replace it. It will be another chassis that we'll be offering within the overall lineup. Um, so there's no ETA that I can give you right now, but it's definitely not in the immediate future. Now, are we going to have some other chassis coming out? For sure. We've already made an announcement for the GT502 which will be a new chassis under the Tough Gaming lineup. And then we, of course, have the upcoming AP201, which will be in white and black, which will be coming out the first chassis for our Prime Series. And we may have a couple of other things that might be coming out, and you're just going to have to keep it tuned here to the ASUS PCDIY stream, as well as, of course, to our PCDIY group to find out what's going on there. So make sure to keep it tuned there. All right. Um, sounds good. Um, so let me see right here. <laughs> H2O's computers is saying, is it just as heavy? Um, I would actually say that it's going to be heavier because, well, you know what? Um, you know what? I'm not going to comment on that because the way that the chassis is designed and a couple other things, it, it'll be interesting to see how it comes out in terms of weight. But definitely this is not going to be, um, you know, 
uh, a very super light chassis. This is going to be, again, really towards people that are looking, I think, for a showpiece, high-end, um, generally custom uh, water cool configurations, or, you know, very, I think, RGB-centric, lots of fans, a lot of really kind of visual interest in that. So make sure to keep it tuned, and uh, we'll see what happens, all right? So uh, that takes us in terms of our UEFI updates. All right, so next up, uh, let's get ready to maybe uh, talk about some giveaways. Yeah, I think everybody's always interested in hopefully some, some cool giveaways. So let me go ahead and bring up my links here so that I can have actually all the links here for all of our different giveaways that we have going on because there's quite a number of them uh, that we do have. So uh, if you guys, of course, have been watching the streams as of late, um, I think probably almost every week for the last couple of months, um, I've had, you know, at least two to almost maybe four, if not more giveaways going on. So quite a lot that's going on. So uh, first up, let's go ahead and uh, show you guys here. Our, uh, we still have our giveaway going on right now for um, our fans. So if you guys are interested in actually getting the opportunity to pick up on some cool fans, um, then uh, we got you covered. So this will be for uh, the brand new upcoming Tough Gaming ARGB fan, which will be a three pack, which also includes the new ARGB controller and fan controller that we have for this fan. Um, and then we also have the currently available, the XF120, which is our premium um, non-RGB maglev based bearing fan. So um, two great fans and you have the opportunity to essentially win either one XF120 right here, or you can see a pack essentially of the TF120. So either one, all you got to do is essentially just put in your information, click submit, and you get this little kind of roulette um, that allows you to go ahead and see if you've won. Um, I think this is going on until, I believe, July. So um, make sure if you're interested to just go ahead and enter in and get your opportunity to go ahead and see if you can pick up um, some cool fans. So that is going to be one giveaway that we have going on right here. Let me go ahead and drop that link in the chat. Great. All right. So next up, let's see what we got going on. Uh, we have, I believe, our Zen Wi-Fi uh, giveaway that's going on, which is still active. Yep, uh, this one, you want to make sure to get on it because there's less than 41 hours left, okay? So uh, if you're interested in actually winning um, the Zen Wi-Fi X-T8, uh, which is a really nice high performance based um, 811 ax um, based essentially mesh networking solution. This is under our Zen Wi-Fi series. A lot of people know about our routers. Both of these are award-winning products. They really offer great stability, functionality, range, and speed, along with really extensive feature set. If you go into the Asus router app or the Asus WRT firmware, um, lots of really great options that are going to be available to you. Um, this is a pretty expensive, actually, mesh unit. It's not our flagship, but it's pretty high up there. You can see the actual, this unit is a $450 mesh router solution. Uh, this is going to be great to be able to cover even large multi-store environments. So, you know, my home, it's a, you know, a little bit over 2,800 square feet, two floors. This would easily be able to cover the entirety of my house, uh, the garage, the uh, backyard, and the front patio space, right? So a lot of overall coverage. Um, so we're going to actually be giving three of these away. So if you're interested in getting in on this, again, all you got to do is go into the applet and uh, you have your opportunity to win. So I would recommend if you're looking to maybe upgrade your Wi-Fi and not have you cost anything, then get in on the giveaway. All right. Hey, Christopher, thanks for joining us here on the stream. Happy to have you here, man. All right, so next up, uh, let's see right here. Uh, we've got another pretty cool giveaway, and this one is going to be a pretty cool giveaway that's happening um, from our friends over at Falcon Northwest. Um, so Falcon Northwest, if you're not aware, is a PBA partner. Um, that means powered by Asus. So they have really been with us for an extremely long uh, time, and uh, they've really been uh, one of our outstanding partners at really utilizing our core components, especially our motherboards within their systems. And we were actually really with them from the very beginning um, when the design and the development from the Tiki, which was their ultra small form factor, but high performance gaming PC was designed and developed. I remember actually visiting Kelt Reeves, their actual president at their facility in Oregon and talking to them about actually our uh, P77-I deluxe motherboard, which uh, was really kind of a new benchmark for many ITX based motherboards that had a vertical VRM design. It had a huge amount of IO and it was really kind of one of the first boards that you could feel confident having a desktop class of performance 
an overclocking capability, but in a mini ITX motherboard. And over the years, uh, the Tiki has actually found a home consistently with, with these Dash I series. And so um, this uh, system right here is a pretty awesome system. It's actually going to be featuring AMD's latest Ryzen 7 5800X3D. So that's the one with a huge number of uh, improved cache, right, to really be able to offer outstanding gaming performance. It's going to have our ROG Strix B550-I. You then are going to have a uh, reference uh, Radeon RX 6950 XT Bakes graphics card in there. I think it also comes included with like a two terabyte drive. Yeah, a Samsung 980 Pro two terabyte drive. Uh, full operating system, three-year uh, warranty that you're getting really from one of the absolute best uh, builders uh, in the industry with Falcon Northwest, amazing service and support team. Um, you know, you have an integrated AIO cooling solution um, and, uh, you know, even a very high performance. This is pretty much about the flagship that you can get for an SFX-based CPU, excuse me, PSU with an SFX L Titanium 850 watt, right? And then even a uh, really nice amount of memory, 32 gigabytes. So really you're almost kind of don't need anything. And uh, this system for reference, it looks deceptively um, kind of maybe big in this picture. It's this, your a PS5, if you stand a PS5 vertically, is going to be bigger than this system. That's how compact this system is. Uh, there you can see that beautiful ROG Strix B550-I board in there. So that is going to be your opportunity to win this full system. And all you got to do is get in on the giveaway. So a very cool opportunity. Um, I do believe this one is going to be regionally restricted. So, so like some of the other ones that I might have linked, if you check the terms and condition, if you guys are watching us from, of course, outside of the United States, I believe like the tough fan giveaway, that is a global based giveaway. This is going to be regionally restricted. So do keep in mind, I think I'm not 100 percent sure that this is Canada and the United States, but I believe it might be just Canada and the United States. So um, do keep that in mind. OK. You know, so much as I want to see a preview of that case. Um, if I have the images, let me see if I can bring them up right here. I'll see if I can, if I, if I have them right now. I, I don't know if I have them right now. I have early, I have more advanced pictures, but I'm not allowed to show you guys. <laughs> so I can't show them to you yet. I can only show you what we've uh, uh, essentially already publicly outed there. Um, so let me go ahead and, okay, that is cool. So that is going to be a giveaway that we have there. Um, let me go ahead and see if I can find that ROG EATX chassis really quick. And if I can show it to you, I will show it to you guys. Maybe one second here. This is going to be, let me see. If I can find it right here. If I can't find it really quickly, I'm not going to worry about it. I don't have ROG Citadel installed on, on this, on my streaming system right here. Um, so if I, if I did, that's the easiest way. If you guys want to check it out, you can literally go ahead and just download ROG Citadel and you can check out the preview for that chassis, um, as we have it already available in there. Let me see if I can find it in here. Doesn't look like it. So I don't think I'm going to be able to show it to you guys, so, but I will go ahead and prep it for the next stream. Okay. You guys, I will make sure to see. And maybe I can see if I can double check with our team if I can show you um, maybe some of the more current design updates that we have uh, in a transition. I'll see if I can do that. Okay, If I can do that, I will um, do that. Okay. All right. So sounds good. Uh, let's go ahead. And I think we've got one more giveaway, which is going to be uh, an actual giveaway for, I believe, RG. Evangelion based system. So uh, we are actually right now uh, attending a pretty cool event uh, with the Anime Expo 2022. And uh, we have gone ahead and teamed up with our friends over at CyberPower. And bam, you want to win one of these? Look at this. Look, look at how cool the ROG Evangelion hardware looks, right? I know I know. there's so many of you that are waiting for this hardware. And if you didn't already pick up the motherboard and the graphics card, which we already launched, and if you didn't watch last week's stream, you're already aware that, um, you know, coming mid to late July, as we could probably go right into the beginning of August, uh, we're going to be essentially releasing the remainder of the ROG Evangelion-based hardware. Um, but, you know, if you just maybe don't have the opportunity in terms of just being able to pick up this limited edition release, uh, or it's not within your budget, well then, hey, 
you know, you still have the opportunity to be able to win uh, an awesome system right here. So this is a full system right here. It's got the beautiful, the Helios, I think, looks absolutely amazing uh, in this ROG Evangelion-based edition. I'm personally really tempted. I really like the Helios, but I definitely for sure want to be able to pick up maybe uh, <laughs> maybe another Delta, but I'd love to be able to pick up the ROG Strix RX and uh, the Kyrus, uh, those, the keyboard and the mouse, I think look really awesome along with the actual updated uh, uh, gaming mouse surface that we have, I think is a really cool combination. But you can see right here, we've got the Helios, we have the graphics card, uh, we have the motherboard all in there and they look absolutely fantastic. So let me go ahead and bring up this cool giveaway opportunity as it just went live a little bit earlier. So um, I think I have to see if I have the links over here. I need to bring up the link for it. So give me one second and I will get it out to you guys. Ah, yes, I should have it right here. Okay, very cool. Yep, I got it right here, guys. Okay, so um, should be, here's the link. Yep, all right, perfect. All right, so I will go ahead and share this link with you guys. And you can see right here, you've got 13 days to go ahead and get in on this. What are you going to have the opportunity to win? Uh, Core i7-12700KF. Uh, of course, the ROG Maximus Z690 uh, ROG Evangelion Base Edition motherboard. Uh, 32 gigabytes of DDR5 memory. The 3080 edition graphics card of the ROG Evangelion. An SN850, just about one of the fastest PCI Gen 4 um, PCIe NVMe SSDs you can get. An 850 watt power supply. And then, of course, that ROG Strix Helios uh, Evangelion based chassis. So uh, you have your entry mechanisms right there. You've got 13 days to do it. So if you want to get in on it, get in on it. All right. So let me go ahead and share this link for you guys in the chat. Uh, and best of luck to you guys. And uh, hopefully you will be able to uh, maybe win one of these prizes. I, I know, I believe Kevin, uh, Kevin's not with us today. Kevin usually is with us in a lot of our streams, but he actually uh, recently won uh, one of our giveaways. So we have people <laughs> that do win these things. All right, uh, let me go ahead and just see if there's any other questions. We have a question right here is, um, will there be new ROG fans? I want full ROG, but Leanne Lee fans with their RGB lighting is designing, waiting for straight new RGB fans. So we do already have the tough gaming ARGB fans. We are working on kind of a design uh, for an ROG RGB edition fan, but as, at this time, I don't have any information to give you as far as timeline or any other specifications. Uh, but it is something we are looking at in terms of an ROG based fan. Um, now we of course already have ROG quote unquote fans that come with our AIO cooling solutions, but we don't have anything that's standalone. So we are still looking at that. What that might be in terms of it, you know, it's dimensions, it's specifications, the bearing type, you know, it's features, functions, and designs, no information to give you at this time. Um, so I wouldn't expect anything for the foreseeable future. Right now, our focus is going to continue to just be right now with the XF120, along with the upcoming Tough Gaming ARGB fan. And then of course, all our great partners, including Leanne Lee, Thermal Right, Cooler Master, Aska, Fractal. So many partners make just standard three pin straight ARGB, not like the proprietary solutions like you might have from um, Corsair or NZXT or some of the other ones, which you can't directly plug into a motherboard and then be fully synchronized, right? Um, you know, so there are a great number of partners where you can just directly plug them into the board and work with that. But we definitely know that there are users that are interested in having a uh, straight from ASUS ROG based edition product. So uh, make sure to go ahead and just keep tuned here. All right. Um, hey, Jurgen, happy to have you here, man. Thanks so much for joining us here for the stream as well. Very, very cool. Hey, Andy, happy to have you here as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, move along to our next update. I think that's everything. So we, yeah, we got the, um, let's see, we have the ROG Strix XF and Tough Gaming Fan giveaway we talked about. Uh, the Zen Wi-Fi giveaway that I went ahead and linked there, uh, the uh, partner hardware giveaway, right, from Hot Hardware and Falcon Northwest, and then the Cyber Power Special Edition ROG Evangelion. If anybody can just double check that I make sure that I shared all those links in the chat, that would be great. If not, I can make sure to go ahead and put those links in there, but I do think that I dropped them all in the chat. So hopefully uh, you guys have all that information to be able to go ahead and get in on those giveaways. All right.
Oh, okay. So let's see uh, what we've got next. I think next up, um, we're not going to get into DDR5 yet. We'll get into that in a little bit. I just want to go ahead and actually touch on some of the new products that we've got coming out. So give me a second to go ahead and bring up that information and we will get ready to uh, keep moving things along here. So I think first up, let's see here, we've got uh, going to be the Prime B550. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And I went ahead and did a post uh, a little bit earlier this week uh, for people that are, of course, part of our group. They were already aware of this. So this is a, a basic update, but I think this is a really solid option uh, for those that are going to be looking for something that's going to be, um, you know, uh, more aggressively priced. I don't like using the word budget. I think a lot of people misuse the word budget. Budget mean it can be $100, it can be $500, it can be $1,000. That's what the word budget means. It doesn't mean low cost, but a lot of people use it interchangeably as somehow meaning low cost. Um, so... Uh, I don't like to use the word budget motherboard, um, uh, but this is definitely at a lower price point. It comes in at $140, so this pairs really well, I think, with users that might be just looking for a general entry-level uh, PC build. Maybe pairing this with something like AMD's new Ryzen 5600 um, series uh, uh, processor, which is priced pretty aggressively, but you get that nice modern uh, Zen 3-based architecture, really solid performance, up improved memory controller, right? This could also pair definitely with one of their G series uh, processors too, which has integrated base graphics. So you've got a solid power stage based VRM, definitely not gonna have any issues running any of those CPUs. Now it's not gonna have um, the same type of heat sink design that you're gonna have on more advanced boards so that if you're really aggressively wanting to run sustained multi-threaded base workloads with something really high end, so like 5,800, 5,900, this wouldn't be the board that I would recommend. I would be recommending another board. Not to say you couldn't run that in this board. It just would be that under sustained multi-threaded scenarios, you're going to really be applying a lot of heat. And the actual limiting factor isn't the actual power stages. It would just be potentially maybe the thermal environment that you would have for the VRM. Um, and if you had enough airflow, again, it wouldn't be a factor. But I think this pairs really well with, I'd say, in the vicinity of something like a 5600 series class would be kind of my peak recommendation. You could go even a little bit higher if you wanted to. If you were going to be just talking about general desktop use and gaming use, no problems. Um, and beyond that, of course, you've got dual M.2, so easy in terms of being able to upgrade. Um, the big update compared to the prior generation there is going to be the improvement for Wi-Fi 6. And you're also going to, of course, have Bluetooth. This board does also have rear USB Type-C connectivity available to you. Um, isolated audio design is also going to be present on the board. It's just a solid, stable, reliable option coming in $140. Bucks. It's a good baseline option, like I said, if you're looking for maybe something like a Santa NAS box, general productivity box, or maybe just like a basic, like I said, gaming system, put in something like a 3050 in there or an RTX. Um, yeah, like an RTX, I think 3050 or, or even the new uh, 1630 that it got announced or on the AMD side, maybe something like an RX 64, 6500 um, or even 66 if you want to kind of go for like price to performance kind of proposition could also work well there. So here you can see um, it's got the nice, clean, nice white design aesthetic that the Prime series offers, which I think is a great foundation in terms of the overall look and feel. We'll go ahead and just wrap it up here with, of course, your rear connectivity. So actually a pretty decent set of connections right there with USB 3. Uh, this is your USB 3.2. Uh, and then you've got your USB 3 here as well. Um, this is going to be one gigabit. Um, are, uh, uh, in terms of the networking connectivity and then Wi-Fi 6. Now, if you're maybe looking for some alternatives, um, let me go ahead and see if I can go ahead and bring up my post from the PC DIY group. Because while this one's coming in at 140, there are a couple of good other options that I would say are in here if you're looking for maybe a board that might be um, you know, reasonably priced, but maybe not too much more. So you can see right here, we've got our post that I went ahead and put up that gave you some good information regarding the board. Uh, we have the Tough Gaming B450M Pro S, which is actually cheaper at 115. Now you're going to step back to B450 versus B550, but you actually get a more robust VRM heatsink design. You're also going to get 2.5 gigabit networking on that board. You actually get a little bit better audio package with the DTS audio suite. So this is always where there's an interesting balancing act. And from a perspective, it supports the same exact CPUs. There's no difference, right? So it really just comes down to whether you want the B550 based benefit of PCI Gen 4, um, which in all reality is not going to be something that is critical, but you know, maybe with direct storage coming up, um, you might see a little bit of performance benefit in that regard in terms of kind of the overall storage responsiveness. So that could be something to kind of evaluate. But for me, I think that's a really great option and actually even being a little bit less, but you don't get Wi-Fi on that motherboard, right? Um, 
We also have the ROG Strix B450-F, which is an ATX-based motherboard. This is the version 2. Um, it's essentially the same price, and you actually get quite a number of upgrades. So you get M.2 heatsinks, much higher-end audio design. You're going to get a much more robust VRM heatsink design and integrated I.O. shield. There's going to be a lot of other improvements, and it's literally at the same price, but doesn't have Wi-Fi on the board, right? It's also, again, B450, not B550, right? Um, B450 Plus is the ATX version, again, here at 120. And then right here, we also then, I gave you another option at maybe the B550 Plus uh, ATX at 145. So a few other recommendations, if you guys maybe have some interest in there, I'll go ahead and drop those there in the chat if anybody's kind of maybe interested in picking up uh, one of those boards. And as far as availability, I would say that you would be looking at for oh, this board, we should probably have this available within the channel. Um, I'd say probably within about the next two weeks or so approximately. And uh, you could expect this probably earliest at Newegg and then followed up by other e-tailers. Okay. You see right here, if we've got any other questions right there. Uh, so Sniff is saying, hey, some of you going to CNE? Uh, yes, I can actually confirm for you that Asus will be attending CNE. So actually, I went to CNE, our uh, last one. I don't know 100% if I'm going to be going. I may be going. I've actually got to get my passport renewed. So if I can get it renewed in, pa in time for CNE, um, if you guys are going to be attending, you might see me there. So I'd love to see you there. Um, but, um, you know, we'll wait and see. But I can tell you regardless, Asus will be attending CNE. So if you do want to see Asus and you want to see some cool hardware, um, maybe even some AM5 stuff, make sure to check us out at CNE. Okay. All right. Okay. So very, very cool. Let me see right here. All right. Uh, hey, A's Jeep, happy to have you here, man. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get into our next product right here. And that's going to be, of course, one that uh, I know many of you are very uh, aware of. And um, actually, I think that, um, of course, Matt over showed off a beautiful build of this not too long ago. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I can bring it up right here. I think he did uh, a build right here with uh, the uh, Noctua-based uh, 3080 base graphics card. So let me go ahead and see if I can bring this one up here. I'll bring that up in a moment. But here we go. We have the uh, follow-up to essentially the 3070 base card uh, with now the 3080 base card. So this is going to be a great addition for those that are essentially, again, looking for ultra cool, ultra quiet card. Now, our cards are already really kind of leading the industry when we talk about cooler, quieter, and faster, and really built to the best standard using our Asus Auto Extreme production process. Um, but the collaboration with Noctua is really kind of just to even take that to the next level, right? Be able to take the ultra high performance and the premium design that we have with those Noctua based fans. We actually redesigned the actual heatsink and fan assembly to be able to complement those fans. We go to even a larger base cooling solution. Keep in mind that our normal cards, you're generally talking about maybe like something like a 2.9 slot. This is a 4.3 slot base graphics card. So it's a very large graphics card. But with that, of course, size, you're going to have outstanding cooling performance and the quietest card in its class. It's effectively pretty much almost silent. Um, it's an outstanding card when you're talking about the performance level up to its acoustics, right? It's really in a whole nother league. Um, and it is a limited production-based graphics card, so it is not necessarily something that's going to be consistently available. Um, but we are going to be excited in terms of releasing this card. In terms of the overall availability, we're probably going to be looking at about the middle of August. Um, let me see if I can confirm the e-tailers right now for you in terms of the availability. I'll check on that in a moment right here. Um, on just, you know, general recap, I'm not going to talk about the 3080. The 3080 is pretty straightforward. Most of you guys are pretty much aware. Um, I will touch on a couple of things right here. This does still utilize what's called our max contact base base plate, which means it's a machine finish base plate, which is very similar to the machine finishing that is used on high performance water blocks. It has a dual BIOS design. So that means that we have a performance and a quiet mode. They both essentially will offer the same performance. The main difference is going to be a different tuning to the fan curve, which in reality, it's quiet and then pretty much almost near silence is what you're talking about. The card still does support zero dB technology, which essentially just means that the fans, when they're underneath a certain wattage, 
and certain load standpoint, the fans won't spin. So this is great when you're just checking your email, when you're watching a stream, uh, when you're playing maybe basic games that don't have a heavy load, uh, the card actually won't spin. And in that scenario, it'll essentially be very, very quiet. Um, this is outdated right here in terms of GPU Tweak 2. You can still use GPU Tweak 2 on here, but this card is also fully compatible with GPU Tweak 3. So it will work with GPU Tweak 3. And you can see, of course, it has that classic design aesthetic, uh, which you would expect from Noctua series products. Um, and there you can see kind of a little just exploded view, right? That also ultra large, massive heatsink assembly right there. Uh, then of course the Noctua shroud along with the fans and then a back plate that's in integrated in there and you are good to go. All right, so that is going to be that card. Re uh, the MSRP for this card will be coming in at a thousand dollars essentially so 999.99 uh will be its actual price and let me go ahead and see here if i can confirm on the e-tailers it is not what we refer to as a channel wide SKU. um so that does mean that it will be uh, a specific assortment that will be available uh as far as the availability so let me see right here um amazon will be available new egg will be available Micro Center will be available and the Asus eStore. So those are the four e-tailers uh, that will essentially care. Um, Micro Center would be a physical e-tailer um, that will be carrying the card in uh, the United States. For our friends in Canada, I would probably expect maybe a little bit later availability, maybe towards the very end of August. It could be a little bit earlier, but it depends on logistics. Uh, for Canada, we're looking at Canada Computers, uh, Memory Express, and Newegg Canada. Okay. So this will be available for both North America and for Canada. And let me see right here, um, if I can just bring this up quickly. Give me one second and uh, see if we have any questions right here. Paskowitz, no, no Chromax edition of this card. Uh, this will only be in that in that specific colorway. We definitely know that we have had people that have kind of asked about wanting to um, essentially kind of see a Chromax edition based version. Um, you know, that's fine. But personally, you know, I think I really love the aesthetic uh, of the kind of the classic Noctua series. But I, I, I know that some people would love to be able to see a Chromax edition version of it. Um, but keep in mind, literally the design and development of this predates um, the design and development of, uh, well, not the design and the development because the Chromax, the black edition um, Noctua cards were in design and development for a very long time, but it predates their release. So our focus was of course going with the card, uh, with the fans that were already available. Um, so yeah, I have it right here. This, if you want to kind of just see what it would look like in person in the system, this is by Matthew Lee. Um, fantastic build. Um, we'll probably be featuring this in the Builder Spotlight, but you can see right there how it looks in that vertical orientation. It looks great in the horizontal orientation as well, but it is a fantastic looking card. Again, make sure if you are accounting for it, it's a 4.3 slot based card. Yeah, Paul is saying that my uh, RTX, my tough gaming uh, uh, card is already quiet enough. And again, our cards are already really tuned to be very cool and quiet. Um, but this kind of just goes into a next level, right? Um, so, you know, it's for those that are super critical, you know, and want to kind of take it to the next level, um, you know, if you just want to go a little bit more. Tell us, can you tell us about the features of Q Design? Um, yeah, Q Design actually covers quite a number of things. Do you have a specific question on Q-Design? Because Q-Design literally means um, it can be any number of things. Like if I took this motherboard, for instance, the fact that we have a uh, single-sided memory latch design, which means that there's a latch at the top of the memory, but there's no latch here at the bottom, that is Q-Design. It's called Q-Dim. Um, this actual little lot, this right here, um, we were the first ones to implement these ultra-large, what are called Q-Slot actually retention levers to make it easier to depress. But now, of course, on new motherboards, we have the key release button, right? Which you can press a button to eject the graphics card. So that's also key release, right? Um, we then have Q latch, which is the M.2 latching mechanism where you can install an M.2 SSD with no screw and it just latches in. Even the shield, the Q shield on motherboards. So uh, if you can give me, uh, if you're wondering about a specific Q design feature, I can try to see if I can give you a little bit more information. But Q design in general um, is a wide range of different features that we've introduced over the years on our motherboards to be able to make the PCDIY build experience just better right? Um, ultimately make it uh, a easier and more straightforward process for you. Let 
me see right here. Do you know um, a Lord Z Zion? Uh, if you can maybe email me or maybe clarify in your comment what you're actually asking about in terms of your hub installation, um, I can try to see if I can provide some more feedback to you. And again, if I can't get to it, make sure to go ahead and either you can email me pcdiy.asus.com or make sure to join our PCDIY group and definitely feel free to go ahead and post your question there within the community, okay? Okay, um, so let's go ahead and move over into our next uh, product right here. And this one is not going to be, I would say, a direct uh, product update, but it's kind of like a little bit of sidebar and maybe a reintroduction to another product. Um, so let me go ahead and just uh, bring it over here. And this is going to be for an announcement, of course, from AMD. Um, so if you guys uh, haven't followed right, AMD, of course, has their mainstream Ryzen series processors, which would be on boards like for B450, B550, and X570. And then they have Threadripper, which is Ryzen Threadripper, right, which is on the TRX40. And then they have their highest end CPUs, right, which are going to be for ultra high core count, quad channel memory, and the most PCI Express lanes, 128 PCI Gen 4 um, lanes that are going to be available. And that is on Threadripper Pro series processors, right? So these are their WX series processors. So the current processors that have been available had been the 3000 series, but now AMD is getting ready to release for the DIY market, the 5000 WX series processors. So these are going to be based, of course, on the Zen 3 microarchitecture, which you've already had within the mainstream series CPUs. Uh, so something like your 5600X or your 5900X, um, those are already utilizing, but now you're moving that into this latest generation. And uh, this is just going to be offering a whole nother level of performance. As I noted here, we're going into another stratosphere in terms of not only the pricing, but the performance. This is really centered not towards general users. This is really for those of you that are going to be under advanced science and simulation, very specialized multi-threaded workloads, high-end you know, ultra high end content creation. So we're talking about, you know, not 4K, we're talking about, you know, uncompressed raw, raw workflows. You know, this could be 8K, this could be 12K, uh, HDR, topographical analysis, you know, ultra large portrait processor and landscape, um, you know, all types of things like that. Um, and you can see right here, like 64 cores, and then you add in, of course, your uh, your additional threads, right? And you, that would be up to 128 threads. So we're talking about massive performance. And of course, we do have a board that does support uh, this feature set, and that is going to be with our WRX80 board. So let me go ahead and uh, just bring that one up here. Let me see here. So this is our, of course, um, Sage series. So this is actually under our WS lineup. So we have our Prime series, we have ProArt, we have Tough Gaming, ROG Strix, and ROG. But some people don't remember, we also have our WS series, which is our workstation series. So this is um, our Sage series motherboard, which is designed with the WRX80 chipset, which is designed for Threadripper Pro. We have gone ahead and released a UEFI release, which does fully enable support for all the 5,000 WX series processors. So if you're looking for a board for these CPUs, um, you, it goes all the way down to, I think, something like a 16 core base variant. And then, of course, the highest end model is the 64 core base variant. So there's quite a number of offers that will be available, right? Um, and this board is just next level, right? I mean, you can see right here, um, it has kind of the design specifications are really kind of in another class in terms of what you would expect here, right? Um, so you can see you've got a massive amount of PCIe slots. These are all course, physical by 16 slots. Uh, this board also is going to have uh, three uh, M.2, PCI Gen 4 M.2, plus it is also going to come included with a quad M.2 add-in card. So that means seven M.2 base SSDs, quad channel memory. Um, it has in terms of the rear I.O., you can see all of these are all 10 gigabit base USB, -C, USB. Um, then dual USB-C right here, including 20 gigabit and dual 10G LAN. Um, so this board is seriously kind of designed for the next level. And then even here, some people kind of wonder, like, why would you put U.2 on a motherboard? And I thought I would actually take a little bit of opportunity to give some context to actually why you would still use U.2. Um, and really the benefit from U.2 is a lot of people forget that one of the key 
aspects is that M.2, it's great. It's really simple to work with, but it was designed first and for foremost, not for the desktop, but for laptops. Um, so it actually has a lot of challenges in terms of fitting a huge level of NAND onto the drive. It has a fixed power envelope and then it has thermal challenges because you're literally talking about, you know, something that's this small, right? But U.2, because it's physically larger, um, generally the drives are going to be maybe about twice the size. So if we were to compare, um, for instance, here, you know, a SATA based SSD, uh, U.2 drive is going to be about the size of like a SATA based drive, but generally it'll be about twice as thick. A lot of times you can fit a lot more NAND in there. So right now we just started to see eight terabyte M.2 SSDs. We've had eight terabyte U.2 for years, literally for years they have been available. Um, and U.2 right now, you can even get up to, for instance, right here, you can have a almost 16 terabyte U.2 based drive. So it has significant advantages because you can fit more NAND in there. Um, and then when you apply things like the controller technology, uh, the actual wear leveling, sustained performance, um, including solutions like Intel Optane based U.2 drives, they will significantly outperform even the fastest PCI Gen 4 M.2 SSDs. It's literally not even close. When you talk about um, read latency, um, actually consistent uh, read performance, random read performance, or performance when the drive is actually filled over time. A lot of people don't have an understanding that an M.2 SSD, as you actually fill the drive, generally the performance will actually go down. It'll go down like this. Um, we take, for instance, like an Optane drive, it does not literally care. Literally from 10% to 40%, to 60% to 80%, the drive is providing to you pretty much the same exact performance envelope. So that's the reason why they're um, so much more favored within the enterprise segment. Users don't consider this um, just because you know it's more expensive in terms of these drives. But if you really care about the best overall responsiveness, even things like game loading, again, an Optane solution will beat pretty much any uh, PCI Gen 4 M.2 based SSD. So this is part of kind of the reasoning um, why we still offer something like U.2 on our um, workstation series based motherboards. OK, so uh, that is another little kind of sidebar update that we had available there. Let me just go ahead and see if we have any questions there. <laughs> Dev goes, how come we don't have any father boards? Uh, you know what? You could call these father boards if you like. Um, no worries. You can call them whatever you want, uh, whether you want to call them a motherboard or you want to call them a father board. Um, as long as you have the model number, uh, you'll be able to get the board that you're looking for. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, Paskowitz is saying, when a motherboard and CPU cost as much as my high end custom water cooled build. Yes, definitely WRX. 80 and Threadripper Pro are expensive, very expensive base platforms. These are true kind of workstation class series parts. So the cost is significantly higher than our kind of general, um, our general kind of PC DIY centric motherboards, right? I like Sniff uh, Zard here. I need one of these for my Lightroom editing. <laughs> um, Andy goes, uh, yeah, two type C ports. Yes, there's two type C ports. But keep in mind, if you wanted to get crazy because you have so many of those PCI expansion slots, there's partners like, let's say, Sonet, right, where you could get like a six port USB-C adding card, right? So, And you could have those all be, you know, high speed in terms of, you know, 10 gigabits right across that so if you wanted more points hey go for it right um still the vast majority of users are using type a they're not using type c type c tends to right now be predominantly reserved really um most on at least on the desktop side um we have tons of peripherals but even the peripherals the peripherals you see on their connector end but on the other end are using type a because there's no real kind of immediate benefit to having it be uh type c on the other side right Okay. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, go from there. And we will go to our next product right here. So give me one second to uh, bring up here <clears throat> our next product. So let me see. I think next up we have our new mini PC. And then we are going to get into a little bit of a DDR5 demo, guys, which I think is going to be kind of cool. Or DDR5 explainer demo, maybe a little bit kind of combination of both of those things, right? Oh, no, we still have actually three three items here. Okay, so uh, next one is going to be a very low-cost option, and this is going to be our Zen Drive. Uh, I know probably... I'd like to know, however many of you watching right now in the chat, tell me if anybody is still using any optical media, right? Um, so... 
This is going to be our new Zen Drive V1M. Uh, we already essentially have a very wide, actually, optical portfolio right here. The main one, uh, that the, the main kind of thing that this is introducing right here is going to be that this integrates the USB-C cable into it because, of course, we're finding that now there are laptops like, let's say, laptops that we're selling with our G14 or our ZenBook, um, you know, S OLED, right? Um, that might you know, have these USB-C ports and just users want a simplified experience, we've integrated actually a USB-C cable along with this drive. So this is going to be for users that still want to be able to have access to be able to playing back CDs and DVDs, as well as being able to burn discs. Um, one thing that is kind of cool is that if you're not aware, this drive does support MDIS technology. I want to give it just a little bit of plug that if you're not aware, you know, the recommendation always when you talk about data backup is to not just have your data backup to a secondary drive, but also be able to have it be able to hopefully have even in the third level, right, an offsite or in a location that you can move away very quickly. Um, and when you talk about MDIS, one of the really cool things is that it's a significantly more reliable um, solution than traditional DVD. So you can really kind of scratch the top of an MDIS disc um, and it will not get damaged. It has really outstanding physical reliability. Um, it's actually been tested and validated uh, by their lab teams at over uh, about a thousand years in terms of actually what's called the wear uh, for the actual internal in, internal polymer material where it won't actually break down. Um, and when you just talk about being able to back up things, you know, maybe like certain personal documents, certificates, critical photos, videos, things like that, conveniently, you know, just flash them onto a disc, you can put that into a box and then just not worry about it. You don't have to have the worry about like, even with drives where you have maybe PCB controllers that can fail, you have ESD discharge that can affect the products. You have interconnects, right? That can be broken or fail, right? Here, it's the simplicity of a physical format, right? That you know that you can just be able to go ahead and keep and then be able to access at a later date. So there is some kind of merit to that. Uh, and I think for kind of professional archiving or for very important based documents, it's not a bad option. And uh, I will also say, this is not expensive drive. It's only $35. So it's a low cost alternative. If you wanna be able to just have access to a CD and DVD drive, it's thin, compact, and you're good to go, right? Um, if you did need more capacity, we do actually have a BD version of this. Uh, let me see right here. If I show you guys the BD version. BD, I, but I mean, is by Blu-ray, if you guys are wondering. Uh, that's what I mean by Blu-ray, by BD. Yeah, so this is the Blu-ray version. This one's going to cost you a little bit more. This one would be $100. Still a very compact, slimline-based unit. Um, but this one would allow you to burn Blu-ray and but it allow you to go to a much larger capacity. So if you wanted to even have like 20, 25 gigabyte disks, or if you even want to even go larger, um, the largest BDXL disk that you can get right now for backup purposes is 128 gigabytes. So you can have 128 gigabyte BD disk for backup purpose, uh, which is actually, I think, really great. So that is a great option where, again, if you have like a whole system image, a whole set of files, files, photos, things like that, and you just want to be able to back them up to a disk, bam, you can do that. And you could also use compression. So if you even have larger volumes, you could compress that down into a volume and then put that out to a disk. So, um, you know, two just options that we just wanted to be able to touch on right there. So let's see if anybody right there um, talked about that. Andy Kane uh, asked a question about the Vivo book. I'm not sure if he had a question about Vivo book, but we did just launch some brand new Vivo books, including the Vivo book Pro X's, which are some of my favorite models that we have ever come out with. The Vivo Pro X's are really awesome with the 14 X um, is probably my personal favorite. I think it's a really cool option right there. So Victor says last time was about 10 years ago. Um, HTL computer says, I need this for my dad's PC. Hey, you know, for whatever situation, again, for $35 with the integrated cable and the fact that, you know, you have an easy, you know, to use uh, optical option, it's nice to just be able to have it. Uh, A's Jeep says, I actually have an external Asus drive. Cool. Very nice to know. Um, Paul goes, yes, using optical media to convert audio CDs to FLAC and viewing DVDs. He's along with me. I still actually play back and archive Blu-rays. I love the fact that you get a superior actually level in terms of the encode quality. I'm a big fan of actually DVD and uh, uh, CD in terms of their audio and their flexibility from that. So I actually still do use optical media as well. Um, so let's right here. Uh, Michael notes, yeah, MDIS2, very nice. That's cool. Uh, Snef, Snef goes, is I have, oh, he has a Sony SCSI 2X drive. Not sure if it still works. <laughs> okay. Um, 
GBN Games is going, what test bench is this? This is actually one that you can't get anymore. It's from a fantastic company that used to exist way back when. They were called Danger Den. Um, so you can't actually pick it up anymore. I just got, yeah, I have a Vivo Book version, the Ryzen 7 3700. Yeah, so that's from a little bit, uh, not that long ago. It's still a fairly recent model, but yeah, a big even design change, even compared to your generation user. But and thanks for being um, Team Vivo Book, man. Great units. Uh, and I also like that the Vivo Books come in different colors, which is kind of cool. If you want something that isn't always just necessarily black um, or, you know, kind of gray, that's kind of cool. All right, so let's go to our next model right here. And this is going to be a cool product that coming in at $220 right here. This is going to be the BE24 EQSK, mouseful in terms of the name, right? Uh, but the really cool thing about this monitor is, is that it's going to be actually introducing some cool functionality. It's going to be a little bit more centered towards users that maybe might, might be consistently having maybe a home office environment. So maybe you have the opportunity to work from home occasionally or in like a hybrid work off, uh, hybrid work over scenario. So what we've done with the BE series is one, integrate some controls that are specifically aligned with certain types of web platforms things like Teams or Zoom. And you can see right here that it has actually a full HD webcam and microarray built into the actual monitor. So you, uh, we actually offer this in two different resolutions. So there's a 1080p based version. So this is the 1080p version. And then we also have a 1440p version. The 1440p version is 27 inches. This one is 24 inches approximately at 1080p resolution. They're both um, very thin bezel IPS based displays. They have a lot of flexibility in terms of the default IO that's available to you. And they have full ranging ergonomic adjustment, which is great. So you have the ability to tilt, swivel, pivot, and have full height adjustment, which is really great for kind of a monitor that you're using for general productivity purposes. So um, let's go ahead and just kind of take a look a little bit at here, right? So you can see if we get a little bit closer, um, in terms of our connections right there, right? You can see that you've got your DisplayPort HDMI VGA. You have a USB hub integrated in there. You also have your headphone connection that's also built in there. You have Visa mount support, of course, as well on this monitor. Um, and if we actually go down here, uh, the cool thing is you're going to see that we have front-facing buttons. A lot of monitors, you have the buttons on the back. But the reason why we do actually put these buttons here on the front is because those actually buttons allow for some flexibility in terms of actually kind of uh, web conferencing. So how does that work? Well, let's go ahead and show you. One, you've got, of course, this camera, and the camera can actually be rotated. So depending on where it might be set up, it may be like a small home business office. You can actually go ahead and flip it to one side or you flip it to the other side. That can be kind of convenient depending on different types of scenarios, which is kind of cool. Uh, the fully gray microphone means that if you don't have to have like a mic or something like this set up, you just always have it there and it's directly focused at you, of course, which makes things very convenient, right? And here you can see, of course, the pivot orientation, right? You also see that this can complement actually a mounting kit, which is designed for our mini PCs, which is nice. So if you still want to be able to attach a small form factor Asus mini PC, you're good to go. And uh, let me go ahead and see, do we have the larger model that's actually here? It doesn't look like we have the larger model. Um, but the cool thing here is, let me see if I can bring this up, is that with these actual buttons is you can automatically actually mute or let's say join a call. So if you get a call, you can actually click the button and join the call immediately. So you don't have to kind of physically maybe reach over to a keyboard or reach over to a mouse or something like that. There is some actual flexibility right there to be able to go ahead and manage things on that side. So um, nice option. This one is going to be coming in at, I believe, 219 um, in terms of the price point. So uh, it's not that expensive. And again, um, you are integrating essentially both the uh, monitor and also you're integrating in the camera. Okay, let me see, 2.7. If I can show you guys just the 1440p model. Yeah. So, and if you guys want the 1440p model, this is the 1440p. So I'll drop the link in the chat for both of these right here. Um, excuse me, not the 1440p. This is the 27 inch version, but it's still 1080p. Um, but you can see very similar and you, it's just a little bit more if essentially you want that. So 220 or 260. So $40 more for essentially being able to go to those three additional inches, right? If you essentially want that, um, just a little bit larger, kind of more immersive display, right? Okay. All right. That takes care of those two BE monitors. Let me go ahead and drop those in the chat there.
So HDO Computer says 219, I think that's a great deal. I think it is actually if you consider the price of, like I said, the camera, the connectivity, the frameless IPS. Um, and also keep in mind that, you know, for our monitors, we actually offer a longer warranty than many other companies. So a lot of companies are just a one year warranty. We have a three year warranty system. Uh, there are some other aspects within that warranty you want to go ahead and like kind of look into. Um, but if you compare that to gets like Samsung and LG take, for instance, they offer just a pure one year warranty. That's it. So we offer a longer period right there. Uh, DevTrend is asking any new mini ITX coming out anytime soon. Um, nothing that I can go ahead and speak on. Uh, we will, of course, have the AP201. Um, the AP201 is going to be a more compact based chassis, and that will be coming out very shortly. And that will fit both mini ITX and micro ATX. So um, we are going to actually have a full live stream on this. You're going to see a lot more in the not too distant future on this one, where we'll dive. Actually, we'll do a live build. We're going to kind of go through it. We'll have it in white and we'll have it in black. Uh, but this is a really cool chassis. I'm a big fan of it in terms of its overall design and its kind of layout and flexibility. So it's a very cool option. You can see right here, we'll have this in white and black. And again, this one will be specifically for mini ITX and for micro ITX. Andy Kane is saying integrated mic on the camera. Yes. So this does feature an integrated mic and camera. Uh, they're both there. Yes. And it is a full array based mic. Let's see any other questions right there that came up? Okay. Very cool. All right. So let's go ahead and dive into our next item here. And uh, I think I dropped the links in there. Uh, if anybody can remind me if I drop the link in there for the uh, Zen Drive, that would be great. If not, I will go ahead and just drop it in right now. And that's good to go there. And I think that I drop uh, the Noctua. I guess I can drop the Noctua in there too, right? Okay. All right. So let's get into our last product. And this might be, I don't know, like to a card I'm really a big fan of, but um, this might be maybe my favorite product within all of the new things that we're launching right here. Uh, Paul, don't worry. We're going to get to DDR5 right after this product right here. So um, here we've got the PN52. So this is going to be our brand new mini PC. And this is going to be featuring AMD's newer Ryzen 5000H series processor. So we already have the PN51, which has been very popular. So it's a very compact mini PC. And the cool thing about it is that you can be able to have a very high performance based compact unit, right? Um, the PN51 already went up to a 16 thread based model. So that was very high performance, right? Gave you a lot of flexibility. The big difference is that between the U and the H is the H is essentially pretty much almost a laptop class. So it essentially has a higher power envelope. So this means that you're going to have better performance even for the CPU and even better performance for the integrated graphics. Um, so it is going to be definitely even more tailored for somebody that's going to be putting a little bit more of a demand on this system. So the PN51 already was really just a great uh, mini PC if you want to use it for general productivity, for light editing workloads, uh, actually really solid for even emulation, for a SAN NAS, for a media box, uh, for VMware. There's a lot of really kind of interesting scenarios you can do it with. And this just pretty much gives you the same exact thing but takes it even a little bit further because it even offers a higher level of performance with, like I said, pretty much that laptop class based processing capability. So what do you have there? You have the ability to support up to four displays uh, that are available to you here, including high uh, resolution and high refresh rate. You have a seven USB ports, including two type C, right? Um, with those type C actually being even high speed. So greater than five gigabits, right? You're also going to have our integrated Asus AI noise canceling technology on there. You get 2.5 gigabit LAN that's there. Um, this is a really cool kind of update right here where you have actually a lot of drive support that's going to be available to you. So you're going to have the ability to support two M.2 SSDs. The prior PN51 only gave you one M.2 SSD and then one SATA base SSD. So you had 2.5 inch and then two, uh, excuse me, one M.2. So this drive allows you to have a total of three drives. So you can have two M.2 and one 2.5 inch SATA. So three total drives 
are available to you. Um, you also are going to have optional models that have up to Wi-Fi 6E or Wi-Fi 6, so it depends on the model, okay? So uh, if we just take a little bit of a closer look right here, let's go ahead and see uh, right here. Uh, you can see right here, really nice, just clean user interface, excuse me, a front face uh, for this unit with USB-C, USB-A, USB-A, and then, of course, your combo jack, which is head headset and microphone. And then right here, your power button. You then have venting, which actually goes on all sides right there. So it's on the side, on the back, and on the other side as well. Let me see if we can bring up the image right here. There we go. Oh, they don't have all the image. We don't have all the images loaded up yet. Um, but here you can actually see a little bit of the performance difference. So you can see it's quite a sizable uplift in performance. So you know, seventeen percent, twenty, twenty, almost twenty-three, over twenty-three percent here between a Ryzen U and then a Ryzen H. And again, the U would be in like very thin laptops that we might have had in some of our laptops, so something like some of our Vivo books. But the H was the same processors that we'd be using, similarly, like let's say in some of our gaming laptops. Right, so that's the difference is that it's just a higher uh, wattage envelope that you have available to you. Um, very simple design, four screws, you open it up and then you have access internally to the actual two M.2 SSDs and then to the actual 2.5 inch drive as well as to the SODIM memory. You can fully upgrade all of those. So all fully flexible and available to you, okay? On the rear, um, this will actually, the model that we will sh ship will give you a DP. Um, so you'll actually have up to those four display output configurations. And then the rest you can see is all the same here. So dual HDMI 2.1, and then you have your 10 gigabit display and USB-C. So this supports USB-C, 10 gigabit uh, data, and also uh, alt display. So a lot of flexibility on that USB-C port. And then you've got your 2.5 gigabit LAN, and then right here, more type A, type A, type A. So that's one, two, three four, five, six, seven, seven ports, and they're all high speed ports, right? So very, very impressive in terms of that flexibility. And um, these are two things that I think are really cool right here is that we actually brought in the design from our laptops. So we actually took the fan design and this actually features our new fan design that we integrated in laptops, uh, I believe in 2020 and then into 2021, where this actually has a special chamber that runs around the actual perimeter of the fan. And it's essentially a funnel design system. And so through actually density differences between air and dust, debris, and dander, it actually will move dust, debris, and dander particulate into that channel and that gets expelled out, right? So it doesn't actually settle inside of the actual uh, fan hub assembly, which can affect the lifespan of the fan, which is pretty cool. Um, so we're the only vendor that even has a fan design like this. And this just become, comes from the expertise of what we kind of know at maximizing performance of a fan over time within a laptop. But we brought that and we put that into a mini PC. So that's pretty cool. We also knew for this generation, have a brand new set of fan controls um, with more options within the actual UEFI BIOS, as well as now giving you fan controls within the operating system. So you now have more granularity to be able to kind of tailor your fan controls for these mini PC units. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, just confirm the pricing for you on these. The first two models that we're launching for the PN52 are going to be the system models. That means that comes with pre-installed CPU, memory, SSD, and the operating system. And then a little bit later, we'll have the bare bone edition, which means you're going to pick the CPU that you want um, as far as the CPU. Uh, and then from there, you would then add in your own you would add in your SSD, you would add in your memory, and you would add in your operating system. So uh, 669 is going to be the price for the PN52 with 8 gigabytes of memory, 256 gigabyte SSD, and Windows 11 Pro. And then 869 for 16 gigabytes, 512 gigabytes, and Windows 11 Pro. Again, the bare bone edition will be cheaper than this because it will not come with memory and SSD or the operating system. Okay. Paul is asking, uh, so you need Thunderbolt? We have you covered on Thunderbolt. So if you want Thunderbolt, you would take a look at, actually in our previous stream, we talked about the PL63, or we also have the upcoming PN64. The PN64 will also be the first mini PC that will have 12th gen based, um, excuse me, uh, 12th gen based processors. So we actually do already have you covered there. So here, 
Um, you have actually on uh, a model for the PN64 will have USB 4 or Thunderbolt based functionality. Uh, the PL63 is also a compact unit, and this also gives you already Thunderbolt 4 connectivity. This even supports USB PD input, which is pretty cool. Uh, like with the PN41, which is a much more basic unit and a fanless unit, it doesn't even have any fans. That model also has PD input. Um, so we have tons of different models when it comes to mini PCs. So if you need Thunderbolt, if that's what you want, then we got you covered. All right. All right, guys. So I think now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, DDR5. Uh, actually, let me, sorry, let me put in uh, that uh, PN52 in the chat there. Okay, great. Okay, so um, let me go ahead. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, DDR5. So the first thing is, if you guys have been watching my live stream, you'll be knowing that for months since Z690's release, I've been running four DIMMs on our board since launch. So it's not that you haven't been able to support four DIMMs, but there was a lot of misconception and, and actually miscommunication that actually came out from um, users and even media to some degree when it came to understanding the way that memory worked um, on kind of the platform. So the first thing is, is that um, when people kind of asked about does XMP work within a four DIM configuration? Well, the reality is, is that no memory manufacturer was actually producing four DIM kits. So it didn't matter whether it was G-Skill, whether it was Patriot, whether it was Corsair, whether it was Kingston, whether it was Crucial, uh, whether it was Gel, Mushkin, it doesn't matter. Pick whoever your memory manufacturer was, team group. None of them were making a four DIM kit. That means that actually from a production standpoint, they had binned four sticks of memory. So this is DDR5 here from Kingston. Um, this is a uh, Kingston Fury, right? Um, they did not make a four DIM kit. You couldn't buy an actual four, four sticks of memory in one single pack. And the reason why is because one, one of the key benefits of DDR5 was greater density. So under DDR4, you actually saw DDR4 with DIMMs all the way down, you know, like two gigabyte DIMMs, four gigabyte DIMMs, eight gigabyte DIMMs, and then at the end, 16 gigabyte DIMMs. And that's pretty much effectively almost been about the limit. There was a limited kind of set of 32 gigabytes, but it wasn't really kind of a standard kind of memory configuration from the JDEC standard. Um, with DDR5, the densities are significantly larger. And so the benefit is that with DDR5, you were able to readily be able to have 16 gigabyte and even 32 gigabyte kits of memory, right, in two sticks. So if they do wanted to have 64 gigs within two DIMMs, it was possible. And there is some actual benefits to this, and I'll talk a little bit about why actually you lose a little bit of performance by going with um, two DIMMs versus four DIMMs, even if they're operating at the same speed. And this is because you're actually introducing actually signal la latency, and you're actually affecting the actual way that the actual memory bus is working because you're actually adding more hops, if you want to think about it, by having four DIMMs versus a two DIMM configuration. That being noted, the reason why I bring up the kit configuration is that when we talk about, let's say, a standard kit of memory, so this would be like a standard kit, um, you have the JDEC based specification. And so uh, it might be easier maybe if I actually go into the UEFI, so I'll maybe, maybe boot into the UEFI here on the motherboard to be able to show you. But a base stick of memory has a JDEC based spec, and that JDEC based spec is going to be 4800 MT and then CL40. Um, then there could be an XMP profile, which could be for a number of different reasons. It could be for a higher memory divider. It could be for the lower CAS um, latency. There could be different parameters that have been tuned. So when you buy an XMP kit of memory, the values, so let's go ahead and maybe just bring up a kit of memory. So let me go ahead and, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll bring up a go to like G-Skill site and we'll look at some memory here. But if you were to look at the XMP, right, the XMP memory in itself, that timing, that uh, that operating parameter, right? So here, right, when we talk about this, let's say this 5600, that XMP profile for 5600, CL30, and then even the operating voltage 2.5, which is greater than the standard voltage, which is only 2.0, was designed for only two DIMMs. So what some users would do be like, oh, I want four sticks of memory. So I'm gonna put two of these sticks together, right? Excuse me, two of these kits together to have four sticks right? 
The problem is, is that XMP profile was designed only for two DIMMs, not for four DIMMs. And this is exactly the same thing for DDR4. It's not any different between DDR4 and DDR5, okay? Um, but some users would then go attempt to enable XMP and then think, it doesn't work. Well, of course it's not gonna work because it wasn't designed to work. That XMP profile was validated specifically for two DIMMs, not for four DIMMs. And to have a better understanding of why this doesn't work, we need to actually look at something that is called the Intel um, poor, uh, poor table. So the poor table right here is the official memory spec standard for let's say something like Alder Lake, okay? So when we take a look at this, this right here shows us that when we're running, one slot per channel and one DIM per channel, right? With either one rank or two rank. So one rank would essentially be uh, a lower amount of memory generally on one side versus like memory that has, uh, that excuse me, you have DIMs with memory on both sides, right? Memory chips. And we'll, we'll look at an example here in a moment here. See if I have a stick of memory that I can show you that on, right? Um, but we'll look at that here in a moment. Yeah, I have. I have here that I'll be able to show you guys. So give me one second. Yeah, actually I can do that right now. So let me go ahead and turn that on here. But you can see right here that when we're looking at one DIM per channel, right? Whether one rank or two rank, it can run at the default 4,800, which is that's the standard, right? But you'll notice right here that if we start to actually increase the actual two slot per channel, right? Um, and regardless of the rank, you'll see that that actual value goes down. So that would be 4,400. And then actually, even under the official standard, it's even less, right? If you go to two, two slots per channel, two dims per channel, and then two rank, you can see that it gets all the way to 3,600 MT. So this would be like in a configuration that if you bought like 128 gigabytes of memory, which would be then two slots per channel, two dims per channel, which is also two rank right here, that would be 3,600. That's the actual expected standard. That's the way that's been defined by what the memory controller built into the CPU is designed to operate. Now, as we've done performance tuning and helped it work with Intel and optimize what's called the MRC or the Intel memory code through updates, we've actually been able to enhance this. We can have this value to now almost be this same value, which means that you could run 4,800 even in a two slot uh, excuse me, two slot per channel, two dim per channel, two rank at actually not 36, but 48. But that is overclocking. Some people had a misconception that thinking that they should be able to run that same exact value right off the bank. And that's not the case because it's technically an overclocked value. So that is the first thing to understand is that this is what the base guaranteed operating parameter is. Anything beyond that is always going to be a bit variable because it comes down to one, the motherboard's design, the firmware tuning, the quality of the memory controller, which is built into the CPU, which is variable. And it's very important to understand that if I literally had 10 12900Ks, they could have different levels. I might have five 12900Ks that could run maybe 6000 MT, but then I might have another five that might maybe only be able to reach maybe 5600 MT, right? And that's not a fault of the memory and it's not a fault of uh, the motherboard if it's a well-designed motherboard. It could just be that the memory controller has more margin in it. It's just not as strong. So people understand that already kind of within CPU overclocking that some CPUs are going to be better than others, but they don't realize that just like a CPU being limited and having CPU variants um, in terms of overclocking, you can also have IMC variants, which means the integrated memory controller can vary in terms of how strong it is. And this actually gets even a little bit more complicated when you also account for the fact that the... Uh, the the stress that you place on the CPU and the motherboard can actually be increased when you overclock the CPU and you overclock the memory controller. So think about it like if I'm lifting like 25 pounds of weight right here, and then I'm lifting 25 pounds of weight right here. One, I already have my left arm, which might not be as strong as my right arm, right? But if I'm simultaneously lifting more weight, I'm putting more stress on the entirety of my body, right? And so it's actually more challenging for a system to overclock both at the same time than it is for it to overclock just one value. This is why we always recommend in like our group, I tell people that they, if they're trying to see what the limits of their system are, is to asynchronously, asynchronously overclock first. That means you want to overclock First, your CPU, independently of the memory, keep the memory divider at stock, right? And see what the maximum CPU headroom is. And then you want to go back. You want to reset your CPU back to base 
and then overclock your DRAM and see what the maximum overclocking DRAM is. Once you know the independent maximums, you can then attempt to start to combine them together and see what the maximum level might be. In most situations, it won't generally be the same. You won't have the same max on both levels. It might be that they kind of, when they're come together, it might be a little bit lower on the CPU and it might also be a little bit lower on the DRAM, right? They're still overclocked compared to down here, but, there's, but there is going to be a limitation. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and just see right here if we have anything. Oh, very cool. Kevin says, speaking of DDR5, I just received the DDR5. I won from the Asus ROG giveaway. Very, very cool. Um, so Andy's asking, when installing these DIMMs, then I'd have to update the BIOS um, so the BIOS will see each DIMM. So no, um, I'm actually going to go into the UEFI and show you this. Regardless, we do recommend that right now you update the UEFI BIOS on any of our Z690 series to at least the 1400, if not the latest 1500 series UEFI. This will ensure the best four DIM operating experience, regardless of whether you're talking about one rank or whether you're talking about two rank memory. But you don't have to update it just for the memory to be seen. When you install the memory, the memory works off of its base, what's called JDEC based profiles. So under that scenario, the memory will just post. It will get up and running. It will work. But if you're talking about then wanting to run it at a higher speed, that's when you're probably either going to start to manually tune the memory or attempt to use the XMP profile. And in that scenario, you will need to make sure and uh, ideally have that updated UEFI. So let's go ahead and um, take a look right here. And uh, let me see if I can show you guys a little bit more clearly. So what I'm talking about. So let's go over here and we're going to go to our secondary uh, uh, cam in a second. But I just want to, again, show you guys the difference. So to rank, right? So here we have a stick of Crucial memory. This is actually a very interesting kit. Uh, to my knowledge, I think right now Micron Crucial is the only company from a base standpoint. This is not for your XMP memory kits, but from a JDEC standpoint that has a memory kit that is JDEC, but also has an XMP profile, which is pretty interesting. That's pretty rare. But you can see right here, you have memory chips on one side, and then you have memory chips on the other side, right? And that's because this right here is a 128 gigabyte kit that I have, right? So of course, you have 32, 32, 32, 32, right? Um, on a smaller one rank, right? You only have memory on one side. So you can see there's no memory on the other side. That's what we mean by generally when you're referring to kind of one rank versus two rank, right? So that is one factor. Um, the other factor too, is that when we have four DIMMs that are populated, what I was talking about is actually you can lose performance out and not only that the memory cannot go to a greater speed. So under, let's say, if we only had two DIMMs, for instance, right, two DIMMs, we can see most of our motherboards uh, and most CPUs will be able to have two DIMMs be able to operate up to about 6,000 MT. And I'd say about 75% of memory controllers that have been tested. So that means there is a percentage that won't be able to, but when you go to a four DIM configuration, that value does actually go down. And that's just because it becomes more stressful. Um, and even if you had 6,000 MT in two DIMMs versus 6,000 MT versus four DIMMs, let's say you had a CPU and configuration that you could run either two or four, you will actually lose a little bit of performance because it's actually more efficient for the memory controller to actually access the bus and one channel as opposed to two channels, um, right, in that type of configuration. So you actually are adding some latency by running that four DIMMs. So I know some people aesthetically, they like to just have the four DIMMs, but that is just something to kind of keep in mind. Another note here is you'll see that on the motherboard, always make sure to use the prioritized channels. Um, so we have a silk screen that shows you right there where we have the silk screen that will tell you one is the prioritized bank. That means you would want to use those banks before the other banks if you were only running two DIMMs, okay? So um, let's go ahead and uh, let me see if I can boot into the OS and I'll just quickly show you actually, I guess, how this looks just from a kind of reference standpoint. Um, let me just go ahead and see if we had any other questions right there. So one is, uh, so you can install four DIMMs but you can't use XMP. No, you can use XMP. Um, <laughs> it gets kind of contradictory, right? Because I said that even right now, you can't buy a four dim kit, right? Um, pretty much right now, if you go to Newegg, I don't even think there's any four dim kits that are actually being sold by any manufacturer. That means if you're going to run four dims, you're going to be buying two kits. You're going to buy something that's going to be one kit and then another kit, and you're going to put those together. Now, on our side, we have to, as a motherboard manufacturer, then attempt to tune internal rules that take that XMP value and attempt to make them work 
with a four dip kit configuration. This takes a lot of validation and a lot of, lot of lab work. Now we're the number one DDR5 Intel XMP validated partner. If I go to Intel's XMP data table right now, we have more motherboards and more kits validated than MSI, Gigabyte, ASRock, or any other motherboard manufacturer. So we are putting in the work to do this more than any other company, but it is still challenging because you're essentially doing something that wasn't meant to work. Um, so ideally, the way you would do it would be to manually tune all this, but a lot of users don't want to manually tune it. They buy an XMP and they just want it to work. So we have to spend a lot of kind of background coding work to try to optimize an auto roll to take that value, which was designed for two DIMMs, make some tuning adjustments and try to get it to work for four. And I'm going to show you that you can make it work for four. You can make it work for four DIMMs, but it's also not guaranteed. Um, and it depends. The higher the value you go, the higher the likelihood that you will have an issue. So take for instance, in the four DIMM configuration, I'll show you at 4,800, I feel pretty confident that you probably have over a 90% chance of likelihood of having it work. But let's say you had a 6,000 MT four DIMM kit, that percentage is gonna go down because of things like the IMC and some other factors that come into play. So this is important. Um, and I'll also show you how you could compensate for this. So let's say you bought like a 6,000 MT kit, it doesn't work, well, what do you do, JJ? I bought this, do I return it? Well, you have a couple options. You could drop down the memory divider to get it to work and just go with a slower speed and then maybe also attempt to tune down the latency, right? Um, or you could swap to a kit that's natively just lower if you didn't feel like you didn't wanna lose that speed, right? That comes down to kind of you. So let's go and um, let's go and go ahead and, and, and show you, I guess, what, the, what this all looks like. So let me go ahead and go here to my system. Okay, guys, so we're here in the desktop. Um, I'm going to go ahead and actually shut down my system. And I'm going to actually even clear the CMOS. Okay, so I'm going to clear the CMOS to kind of force it to go into the basic, um, just kind of what it would be like if you literally guys just bought the system for the first time, what it would be like, okay? Okay, so at this point, now the system's been shut down, right? I'm going to go ahead and clear the CMOS. And I'm going to go ahead and remove these DIMMs that I have right here. These ones are actually also crucial DIMMs. I just put on some RGB heat sinks on them. Okay. Let me just quickly see if we got any questions right there. Uh, optimize slots then, JJ, if running two DIMMs. Yes, if you're running two DIMMs, you always want to use the prioritized banks. And why do I say that you want to use the prioritized banks? That's because on all the motherboards that featured four slots, we actually have an enhanced, essentially, trace layout. So we do optimization to these traces, these all these little traces right here that go from between the CPU socket that go all the way to the DRAM, there's an optimized trace design specific for those first two slots that have essentially even a little bit better signal integrity. Um, so that is gonna be, I'd say more sensitive for when you get to higher speed kits. So if you generally buy, especially I'd say anything that might be 6,000, 6,200 or higher, you really want to use those prioritized slots, right? Um, that's going to be, I think, very, very important. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and put in, I guess I'll put in, what do you think, guys? Uh, should I put in the, what do you want to see, the 64 or the 128 gigabyte? Uh, AZ, AZ, A's Jeep is asking, can I turn the five volt off? Um, I hate RGB when the system is off. Yeah, you don't actually have to turn uh, that off. All you need to do is if you want to modify the lighting not being on, you can go into Armory Crate. I can see if I can show you the, the menu option, but there's an option that is actually called shut down behavior and you would change the shut down behavior and you could turn to lights off, essentially dark. So when the system turns off, that lighting would be off for that. So it won't be lit up, okay? So let me go ahead and, and put in the memory right here.
Sorry, guys. It's a little bit tricky doing it upside down. Okay. Okay, we should have all of our memory installed in there. Uh, Sniff says, yeah, that sound when you hear the click. I agree. Uh, the click sound is always cool, right? So... Another thing, too, that some people may not realize is that when you load more memory, um, so, oh, 64, so people said, I put in the 128, sorry. Um, the main difference with the 64 is uh, versus the 128 is with the, if I was to manually overclock the memory with the, 60, with the 64 gig kit, I can overclock the memory a little bit higher. I could show you that even with this 4800 kit, even though it's not overclocking centric, and keep in mind that um, DDR5, it's very important because the PMIC which actually controls the voltage, um, you ideally need the PMIC to be what's called an unlocked PMIC, which extends voltage to be able to affect kind of overclocking margin. Um, with an overclocked uh, kind of PMIC-based IC, I could definitely push it even much further. Um, but with these DIMMs, uh, on the 64 gig kit, I can go to like 5200, which is a nice little just bump up, or you could also bring down the latency. Um, but with the uh, 120 gigabyte kit, I can go over 4,800. I can even do 5,000, right? Um, but there's going to be a little bit of a difference. But one thing to keep in mind is that more memory that you add affects the memory training that the motherboard goes through when it's first powering on. And so um, some people, I don't want to say complain, but some people kind of worry about a system that takes a long time. Um, but you have to realize that the more that you add to a system, oddly enough, more basic motherboards are faster to post than higher end motherboards. Some people think I bought a really expensive motherboard. It should post really quickly, but more expensive motherboards literally have more controllers, more ports, more everything. They might have Thunderbolt uh, controller on board. Then they might have tool NICs that are built on board, right? Then they might have a uh, secondary ARGB controller. They might have a microcontroller, which is for maybe specialized voltage monitoring. Then you add in memory. The motherboard has to go through all the memory training. When you add more memory to the system, it takes longer to train. So actually higher end systems and even more memory dense configurations can take much longer to train and fully initialize than a much more basic motherboard with also um, less memory. Um, this is really actually noticeable in laptops. If you notice like laptops, we can optimize laptops to literally post and boot into Windows within like 10 seconds. It's supremely quick, but that's because we can control the entire optimized experience. Within PCDIY, this is a lot more challenging because there's so many more, more microcontrollers, there are more hardware configurations. There's a lot more things that are kind of going right there. Um, so yeah, Ben uh, Ben gives us some feedback that says, always looks so much better with four sticks, but performance wise, yes. Looks wise, you gotta go with four. Yeah, I mean, if I don't really care. I think two look fine, but I get why people like four, right? But I'm just kind of letting you guys know that you're gonna pay a little bit of a price for four, right? Um, you're gonna take a penalty on one, um, potentially running into more interoperability issues. You're gonna run into scaling issues, right? Um, and you know, there, there's also, like I said, going to be kind of just ease of configuration based issues, right? Uh, compared to that, right? Um, so Steve is going, is that I need 120 gigabytes as my virtual machine used for mapping, right? So you're fine. No worries. You can do 120 gigabytes. I'm going to show you 120 gigabytes can work. Um, it's just that you need to be mindful that as you want to try to scale the higher speeds, that's where it could be more challenging. But if you really care utmost about the stability, if you just want to get 120 gigabytes of the base stock 4800, that's okay. But keep in mind, 4800 is already an overclock, right? Because if we go back to the base Intel spec, 128 gigabytes would actually be only technically guaranteed to work at 3600 MT, but I'm going to show you it actually working at 4800. Okay. Um, so uh, what's, let's see, what's a question here. Andy's saying, what motherboard is best suited for these gyms or is it a personal choice? Actually, it's a great question, and it's not one that you really need to worry about. The really cool thing here is I think this might have already gone through the memory training. Let me go ahead and see. Um, give me one second, guys. Okay, so we're already at the UEFI. So let me go and go right here. Um, he's asking us is that what motherboard is boot suited? The good thing is here, it doesn't really matter. Um, whether you talk about something like our entry um, Prime Z690-A, a tough gaming motherboard, a Maximus Hero, or the Extreme, we're, we've certified internally already in the lab. All of them can reach 6,000 MT, even in a four DIM 
uh, configuration, right? Assuming that the memory controller can reach this. So as long as you're picking an ASUS board, you can feel comfortable and confident. There is still going to be some variability in terms of, like I said, the rank, the memory IC, right? There's differences between Micron, between Samsung, between SK Hynix, between, like I said, 16 to 32 gigs. So there are some other things you have to keep in mind how that might affect the scaling. But overall, you can pick the board that works best for you. So if you prefer wanting to go with our ProArt board or our Prime board, that's okay. You don't have to feel like if I didn't go with the ROG board, I'm not going to be able to do what I'm showing you. I am using this ROG board just because this is my test bed, but you don't have to be super concerned with that. Kevin's going, that's why I picked the a a Apex, a uh, two-slot gang. Yeah, but you can't get the Apex anymore. The Apex is an EOL board, you know? So that's one of the things is sometimes we make boards in a limited production run like the Apex. So Kevin's lucky he got really best-in-class board, right, with only a two-dim design. Therefore, users that really want to push the envelope, you know, 6,600 6, MT or 6,800 MT or even higher, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, so let's go uh, and go in there. So anyways... Let me go ahead and actually go into the UEFI. So we're going to go into the UEFI. Let me go ahead and just get this set up here. All right. So we've gone into the UEFI environment. And if you want to verify some information, you can always go to the tool section. And when you go to the tool section, um, let me go ahead and just make this a little bit smaller for you guys here. OK. Um, you can see right here that we do have a field that says SPD information. Right, so you can always verify your memory and you can go per channel and actually verify all your memory channels if you wanted to. So you can see that they're all registered. You can actually see right here that we'll tell you who makes the actual um, memory. So you can see Micron Spec Tech Crucial, right? And then it gives you all the information, including uh, its rated actually performance parameters, the part number, the serial number, the XMP information, and including the base JDEC. So you'll see right here, we have the base JDEC value, which is that 4800 MT, uh, so CL40, and then it has the rest of that information that's all there. And then you can also see that we actually have some additional XMP profiles that are here, right? Um, and you'll see right here, technically the XMP uh, for this is only 1.1. And that's because it's only been designed for two DIMMs. Now I'm going to show you, for people that say XMP doesn't work on our board, I'm going to show you actually XMP does work, but I'm also going to show you why it's also not XMP because we've internally had to do optimizations to memory voltages and other aspects to get it to work with, quote unquote, the XMP. So technically, this voltage is quite low because this is a conservative standard value, 4800 to 1.1, right? So um, at that point, right, well, what you could go ahead and do this is what most users would do, right? Is that if you were in maybe easy mode, they would just go over here and click this XMP button and go to enabled, right? And you would be good to go, right? So that's one way that you could do it. If we go back to the advanced interface, you could go here and you could pick one of the profiles. Some people wonder what's the difference between the profiles. Um, this profile, XMP2, is going to be the vendor profile. So that means that's the profile that um, Micron, excuse me, Crucial has optimized for their memory that works across pretty much what they would hope would be all motherboards. XMP1, though, is an ASUS specific profile. Why is it ASUS specific? Well, when we designed the motherboard and we designed our memory trace layout and we also tuned our UEFI BIOS, we might realize that we might have more signal optimization, right? Or better signal integrity, and we have other parameters with, that allow us to go, we know that we can maybe run something a little bit tighter, a little bit better than the industry standard. So we still take that base information, but we make maybe a couple of optimizations um, to that XMP, right? So think about it maybe kind of like an XMP plus, right? It's taking our knowing that it's an ASUS motherboard that's running that kit. Um, is there a better choice? No, it's up to you. If you want to be super conservative, then go with XMP2 because there is a slight likely, light, likelihood that XMP1 may still be a little bit less likely to initialize than XMP2. Um, it's your choice. You can run either one, okay? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just go with, uh, I guess we can go with XMP1, right? Um, and that would then allow you to go ahead and go to that value, right? Or I guess we can go with maybe XMP2. Uh, that's fine. Let's just go with XMP1. So we'll go ahead and save and exit. Go ahead and give it a little bit. It's going to have to go through the memory training. That's going to take a little bit. And then we'll go through. And let me just go back and see there if we have uh, any questions that kind of come up there. Um, I have it installed in a two-year-old ASUS board. OK, thanks for the ink. So um, Paul asks, so the quality of the PFU, PSU influence on the RAM. 
That's a actually it's a very good question. The quality of the PSU does affect the overall, I'd say, experience of the system, especially with things like Ripple. Um, there can be kind of more variation within Ripple that when present, there can be deviance that can cause sometimes irregularity of the way systems work. Um, these tend to be more sensitive, I'd say, under overclock configurations than at stock configurations. And this can be really uh, challenging to actually look at. So um, let me go ahead and see if I can actually bring up this to show you a little bit more visually. Um, so let me go ahead and... So Intel has actually what is called a, um, they have a kind of spec compliance standard and the spec compliance standard for the ATX voltage essentially will dictate how much deviation should occur for certain rails, okay? And that, uh, the reason why that is important is you don't want your PSU to essentially exceed the, uh, the exceed those values because then essentially it might not work correctly. It could actually have an issue. Um, but the, the, the tighter essentially that ripple sometimes is, is helping to essentially ensure that operating parameters that tend to be on the more margin of scale will have a higher likelihood of maintaining stability. Now this gets more complicated because of course you have to account for things like power quality coming in from your wall and a lot of other variances and things like EMI where power supply shields can actually have varying levels as far as how much they can be affected by EMI. You might've seen the motherboard cycle there a bit. That actually meant that it was actually going through more of the memory training. Oh, it actually posted already. So you can see the XMP worked, right? It already booted, it already uh, completed its post and its boot. And technically, we can see that was with the XMP. So four DIM XMP and an extreme configuration of, a, of four DIMs is working. But um, let me go back here quick, quick, just to finish that point there with the PSU. Um, so let me see if I can just show you right here. Um, I guess I can actually, I guess I can show you with our PSU, right? So go ahead and show you like here. Let me bring up, I think, uh, the data sheet. Give me one second. <clears throat> In the long run, um, anyways, to your point, it's just as long as you get a good PSU that has good uh, ripple performance, um, I wouldn't be too concerned as far as being like super concerned, right, that, that that's a challenge, right? Um, but um, here's an example, right? This is like our Thor 1000 watt two, right? So you can see right here that at different load states, right? From like a 10% load all to like 100% load, right? You would want to make sure that the ripple performance, right? Um, doesn't have like a high swing to it, right? And there's a certain amount that's actually allowed for in terms of that ripple performance, right? And so we actually strive to actually have a, a much better than standard tolerance level. So um, if let's say the tolerance was like, like 30 millivolts, right? You can see right here, this is only 12 millivolts, right? So that's considerably under the Intel spec standard of being 30 millivolts, we're only doing 12 millivolts, right? So that's a much, much lower in terms of that. So generally the tighter that ripple, the better it is right? Um, in, in that regard, I'd say, especially as you're pushing kind of the envelope. But overall, it's not super, super, um, you know, it's not that that critical. The memory UEFI firmware and those other factors are going to be important. Um, so we've gone back into the operating system here, guys. So we can see right here, let me just go ahead and bring up the task manager. And you'll see that actually right here under memory, you can see right there, we're already at 4,800, right, MT. So we are actually running the um, the corresponding actual XMP. Now, what I am going to show you is I'm going to go back into UEFI, though, and show you where we actually, we've had to actually make modifications to get this XMP to work, right? So you can actually see right there, there's the 2,400. You have to multiply that 2,400 times 2, right, because it's double data rate. It's DDR memory. So then that means 4,800. So we know that we're running that four DIM configuration, right? So we are good to go in that respect, right? And then if you guys wanted to test your memory, you know, you could do this a few different ways. I recommend um, using stuff like OCCT, um, or you can use Intel XTU, or you can use our built-in memory test, which is in our UEFI BIOS. Um, both Intel XTU and OCCT are free if you want to be able to test your memory. Um, I'm a big fan of 
either one of those applications that you can go ahead and do it. You could run that, right? Um, and depending on your kind of memory configuration, uh, you'll be able to see, like here, my last memory test ran fine, you know, 15 minutes without any issues. It was entirely stable, right? You can, you know, go in and you can configure all that. But let's go back into the UEFI and I'm going to show you the actual, uh, how the, the memory tuning has been adjusted there. Yeah, so Sniff says, I think a good branded gold PSU would be okay. So yeah, I mean, definitely, if you generally start to look at um, uh, essentially a Lambda or cybernetics based certified, you can actually look at the Ripple reports online. But all of our PSUs, you know, where we have our gold or platinum or even titanium rating um, are good. Generally, when you especially go into a platinum or titanium rated PSU, the Ripple performance tends to be very, very good. They can still vary from manufacturers to manufacturers. Um, I will tell you that some people don't realize, though, that cables can affect ripple performance and efficiency performance so sometimes when people want to use custom cables and also use aftermarket cables and not the cables that come to psu they look great but keep in mind sometimes you actually can get worse performance this is why I also ideally not always but ideally tell people if you want to first test your system 100 use the original stock inbox cables get everything dialed in and then swap to your cables after the fact um, if you want to kind of be the most balanced at trying to kind of evaluate your kind of system okay yes so the mem test that's what i said um we already have that built into our uefi bios so if you want to test your memory you can just do that inside of our uefi bios the mem test so you can see right here we've gone ahead and entered back into the uefi and if you wanted to actually test the memory right here you can see right here, we have a button that allows you to click that. So I'll show you guys that there in a moment. Uh, some of you guys are already aware of that, right? Um, but what you'll see right here is that when we actually are going to go to um, DRAM, right, um, these DRAM voltages, we've actually had to make modifications to the actual memory controller voltage. So if you remember, the actual standard right there was actually quite a bit lower. So you can see we've actually had to manually tune the memory voltage to 1.35, right? So technically, while the XMP is there, we can tell you that it's not 100% XMP because we've had to do special memory training and tuning and auto rule tuning to be able to implement getting that memory to be able to run at essentially a non-standard table. So we're using kind of the values for the memory in terms of characteristics like its memory divider, and then also the cast latency, but we've had to make changes. Now, there's other auto rules that are changed here. I'm not going to go through all the auto rules that got changed, but this is just to show you that it's not a pure kind of XMP in that respect, okay? Um, now, if let's say maybe this kit was a higher performing kit, right? So let's say it was a, a higher performing kit. Let's say you guys had like a 64 gig, 6,000 kit, and you went through and you did this and it didn't work, what would you do? Well... Th that would be a scenario that what you would do is essentially you would clear the CMOS, you would reboot back in, and then you would set the XMP profile. So you do what I did earlier, right, where you would select this profile, you would pick the profile, right, instead of like 48 or 44, right? So let's say this was 6,000, you would pick this, and then you would manually set this divider to see something less. So let's say it was 6,000, and 6,000 wasn't stable, right? So what you would do is you would go back in, and maybe you'd pick something like 5867 or 5800 or even 56, right? And then see if your system posted. If it did, then your option could be that while you might be losing a little bit in terms of the memory divider, right? What you could do is you could tune back the actual latency. So if let's say the latency was uh, 6038, well, maybe at 5,600, you could tune it down to, 50, to 32. So actually, you could have that 5,600 kit maybe actually outperform the 5,838, right? Or the 6,038. So there are ways to sometimes offset that if you happen to be in a situation where your CPU was weaker, okay? But ultimately, you can see here, what we did show you is that you were able to fully, um, essentially, have uh, the 4 dim configuration weight work and even have XMP work. I just showed you that it does work, right? And again, if we wanted to test the memory right here, just click this button and we can boot into the memory and it will actually test our memory. So you can see right here, it's very straightforward. 
<laughs> I like Sniff. Sniff saying, no, uh, make it pretty and then make it work. Sure, that also that also works. Or if you get really good, uh, you know, cables, right? You get uh, you get guys that are in the community that know how to make good quality cables. Um, that are also accounting for distances and things like that. Then you can feel comfortable and confident that you're not going to be compromising. So I don't want to say that inherently just by going with an aftermarket cable. Extensions tend to be a little bit more problematic than. Uh, custom cables because extensions actually because they become longer means that you'll generally reduce your efficiency. Um, but if you go with custom cables of a high quality uh, company, um, whether it's cable mods or mainframe customs or um, uh, excuse me, million dollar PC, right? MXPC, right? Or Reaper or you know any number of the other kind of options that are out there, you can feel confident that you can still have a very good experience, right? Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and exit out, right? Because I'm not going to just uh, let it run through the whole thing. But you could also then go ahead and exit. And if you then wanted to even run like a bench benchmark on the memory, store the information, you could do this, which is pretty cool, where you could actually test your memory. You could store the information and you could do all this. So there's a lot of different options and that's all just built within the UEFI. All right. So that takes us through um, pretty much a DDR5 demo. That ran a little bit longer. I'm still going to squeeze in maybe a couple of builds in here quickly into the PCDIY Builder Spotlight, guys. So let me try to go ahead and just squeeze a couple in here and we'll go from there. But hopefully for some of you that were just kind of wondering about a better understanding, hopefully DDR5 and some of kind of the challenges um, that can kind of come into that is that one, to recap, the latest 1500 series UEFI, which is available on all Asus Z690 and B660 series motherboards, that latest UEFI release um, really gives you a great experience, whether you're talking about 2DIM or whether you're talking about four dim and regardless of whether you're talking about single rank or whether you're talking about dual rank um, configurations um, you can get a good experience when it comes to either one of those configurations um, if you guys have more questions consider really joining the group i have a post in there that's called ddr5 insights which gives you more information that i break this stuff down and in the future i will actually have a step-by-step -step guide that will kind of go through some of these things as well as maybe some tuning options like if you want to tune down your memory so maybe You've got a 6,000 kit, but you're maybe just your memory controller is not that strong and you want to know how to tune down to maybe 5,600, but with lower timings. I will have that coming out in the not too distant future. Over the coming weeks, I'll have actually a, like a cool little performance breakdown that will show you um, high running memory configurations on all of our boards. I'm going to do it on Prime. I'm going to do it on Tough. I'm going to do it on ProArt. I'm going to do it on ROG Strix. And I already uh, started doing it on the ROG Maximus. Um, just as kind of a little bit of validation. So if people kind of just want to see that it's working, you can feel confident. But we've already done that on our side in terms of our teams. So hopefully that gives you guys uh, just confidence to know that things are working well. Okay. Um, so let me just let you see if you got any questions here before we go into this builder spotlight. So uh, choose a PSU who you already don't have a capacitor on the cable, et cetera. A good set of cables will not have an issue like the ASUS Store, Strix PSU, or and C-Sonic. I 100% agree with Sniff's advice there. Yep, definitely for sure. Um, Andy is uh, saying that's a really cool feature inside the UEFI. Yep, 100%. I would agree with that. H2O computers, uh, good stuff, JJ. Thanks for sharing the info. No problem. Yeah, and we'll definitely, like I said, even have some more information um, regarding things like, you know, certain of the voltages that we would recommend adjusting if you need to try to maybe bump up the memory controller to give you a better likelihood and some other things like that. But keep in mind, we've done a lot of that work already within the auto roll, so you don't need to really tr hopefully make too much of those changes in there, right? Um, Okay, very cool. All right, so hopefully you guys found that useful. Let's go ahead and get in here to our last a little portion here. I don't know if I'll get to all of them, so let's go into PC Wheel Builder Spotlight. All right, guys, so for those of you that are already part of the stream, like many of you, um, you already know the PC Wheel Builder Spotlight was where we highlight PC builds from you in the community, um, whether they're from builders, whether they're from modders, whether it's first-time guys or guys that have built 25 systems, doesn't matter. We'd love to be able to show off our ASU systems here, whether they're mini ITX to ATX, air cool to water cool no rgb to rgb so let's see what we've got this uh time around and we've got some really great builds so um let's go ahead and first open up uh, i think a build that we have here from i believe harji so this is actually harji's first build that he's ever had i believe featured here on our pc diy builder spotlight so this build does not have a name uh let me go ahead and 
set my uh, actually i don't i don't think i need to set my rgb back up there oh actually wait let me just actually do that uh really quick so somebody had that question right about how do i set the lighting um for how do i turn off the lighting so you just go into armory crate and let's say here i had all my devices right i'm just going to put my devices back into aura sync keep my pattern right there right but you would head over here and you would go to devices and then you would go to your motherboard. And once you go to the motherboard, there's gonna be an option for the shutdown behavior. So you see right here, it says shutdown effect. So you go to shutdown effect, and then you would see right here, right? You would turn that off. And so then that means that when the system shuts down, the lighting would turn off. If you keep it on, you can then control what lighting effect you would want when the system is uh, shut down, right? But quote unquote, still on because it's in standby power, right? Um, so you can toggle it on or you can toggle it off. It's your choice. You pick which one you want, okay? All right. <clears throat> Get a little sip of water right here. Did I bring up his submission form? Okay, yep. I have a submission form here. Let's go ahead and take a look at this system. All right, let's take a look here. So this is a pretty cool, ah, I like. I really like this. This has got a really kind of cool, kind of clean, minimal design aesthetic right here. So um, let's go ahead and ah, let's, leave, let's leave that there, right? Okay, so... Um, we can see, yeah. So very, very cool. So right off the bat, we can tell no no name, but we can see it's a Porsche theme, right? So of course, you've got that classic kind of Porsche silver color right there. Um, exposed fans, which give it, I think, that little bit kind of more industrial kind of feel, right, uh, that you would expect, which I think is pretty cool. That is really nice. Love this design aesthetic, right? Really purposeful, right? Cool design. And then, of course, you have just a little bit of visibility right there on the inside. So let's go ahead and just see how this evolves as we move a little bit further in. And we can, of course, see we've got the emblem. But so far, I'm really liking what I see. And then, bam, we pull it open. Uh, as we pull it open, we can see on the inside right there, we've got an ROG Strix board. And we have some really interesting runs right here. So we can see back here, we've got, of course, the pump and the reservoir, which then flows in. I'm actually really digging here the gold. The gold, of course, is complementary. It makes sense to align with the emblem uh, within the Porsche, which is gold. Right. And then you've got the red, which is also a color which tends to be present in Porsche as well. So then you get the silver, you got the black, and you can see how all the color schemes are going back to paying homage to uh, kind of that theme at play, right, with Porsche. So that's cool. Um, really interesting kind of layout and runs right here. We can see that not necessarily, I think, purposely um, kind of set up to, I think, show off something specifically, but be greater in terms of the overall kind of just look and feel that he wanted to create a vibe. Right. So I always like that. Either one, you have a focus on either providing component visibility or you have a kind of a holistic vision to really have a certain look and feel. And I think that right here, the kind of look and feel was to have it feel like it a sense of movement, a sense of kind of like some machinery present kind of going on. So I get that vibe. Really beautiful, clean cable management that's done right here. Right. With these nice cables with the bridge combs, just pulling back in there really, really nicely ballistics memory with that nice white right there. And then, of course, we can see right here we've got a nice big block in place there for the CPU. And right there, you guys can see, of course, the emblem, right? Bringing in all the colors, right? So the black, the gold, and the red, right? All at play. And you can see now, when we go back, you really can see how they're all tied in together and they really have that kind of consistent feel, right? So Har, uh, Harji is, this was not his first build. He's not, I don't think he's been doing it that long. So still quite impressive in terms of the overall look and feel that he's got right here, right? Um, but this is his first time being featured here on the PCDI Web Builder Spotlight. But overall, really clean and well executed. I've got nothing really to niggle at right here. I mean, this is all really beautifully done. Really nice, smooth, clean bends that are right here. This is a beautiful bend right here. Just this radial bend, right, that just comes in soups in really really nicely the photography's on point i like the symmetry too right here that we have going from this bend 
Uh, and then this also bend, essentially almost a kind of a, a mirror or an inverse, one going this way and the other one going this way. So that gives you a little bit of depth and contrast, which is really nice. I like just the clarity of keeping it with just a smooth, clean. I don't know if this is actual formal coolant or if maybe it's using dye to something like a distilled water, but really, really nice touch right there. And then you're good to go. So over, and I think actually it made sense to maybe take away from a little bit of the ID visibility on the Strix board to be able to keep that little bit maybe a cleaner design that you might have from kind of that Porsche design, right? Uh, within something like a GT model. So I think that makes sense. Overall, really clean, really well executed, nice layout, nice runs. The bends are on point, color scheme is on point and really pays great, great homage to the theme. Um, it's a fantastic build and it looks great. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the submission form and see what we've got. So this is again from Harji. You can check him out on his Instagram. Um, I think he's got a video right here and I'm going to go ahead and link it right here. Not his first build. It wasn't a sponsored build. Uh, the theme was for Porsche. Three words to describe the build is subtle, classy, and modern. Um, in terms of the core hardware, we've got a um, Intel Core i7-12700K that's running on there, a, a 3090, of course, uh, which is being water-cooled. We then have 32 gigabytes. So this is an ROG Strix D4-based motherboard, so the Z690-A, a 980 uh, PCI Gen 4, MV, uh, M.2 NVMe-based SSD in there. Uh, this is all being powered with a 1,200-watt-based power supply. Pretty much the majority of all the water cooling hardware is from EK, including that Velocity 2 water block, right? Then we have a PE360, Quantum Gold fittings, and then the FLT120 D5 res and pump combo, which is that guy right there, right? Um, and then solo sleeving custom PSU cables. And this is all inside, of course, the uh, 808, which is the chassis, right, from AZZA. Um, and then M uh, MMPC Tech. Uh, for the fan grills, which I think those look fantastic. These grills right here, these are made out of solid metal. And you can see they really bring kind of this really cool kind of, I think, industrialized, but very clean and machined finish to them, right? Which is really, really nice to kind of just elevate and I think bring kind of a nice continuity at giving you a good focal point in the front and then bring through the rest of the build. So really nicely done. Um, $6,000 was the total budget for the system right there. Um, he really loves uh, the two bends and how they came out and how that integrated into the Optimus water block, which he's got on that 3090 uh, graphics card. Anything you change about the build? Nope. Took him about one month's worth of time, and it's pretty much used for gaming. So gaming, Call of Duty, Resident Evil, and Valorant. And he absolutely also loves the motherboard, uh, really likes the overall design, the features, and the functionality. I'd love to know what his Asus AIOC OC result was with the 12700K and that water cooling setup. Should have some very, very nice numbers uh, for that build. So let's see some feedback from the community here. Uh, H2O Computers is giving it. Uh, it's a clean system. Um, yeah, it says, gotta love EK. I would 100% agree. Uh, the Porsche, uh, the Porsche logo is more expensive than the build. <laughs> um, should produce, oh, I like that one. Um, should produce the sound of a boxer motor at the startup, right? Yeah, that would be pretty cool, right? Um, overall, Michael gives a, a feedback right here. It says, gold and work. Gold and red work really well together. I would agree right there. Yeah. Um, overall, I think it's a really cool build. RG, thanks so much. I'm going to drop, I think, a link there in the chat as well. If you guys want to check out the actual uh, video, he's got a little video up for this too that you guys can link in there. Let me go ahead and see if I can bring it up really quick. See if we can drop him a like. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Uh, did I find it right here? Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, so here we guys go. Uh, you guys can go ahead and check him out, right? Harji's got his channel right there. So uh, we went ahead and already gave him a subscribe. Let's go ahead and give him a like. Bam! Let's do it live. There we go. We gave him his like, and you guys can check out uh, the whole little build. Uh, we got ads there. Let's not worry about the ads. But um, overall, uh, I will drop that link in there. And you guys can check it out. Oh, there we go. There we go. Let's skip the ad. You guys can check out some cool little footage there. Little B-roll and see it all come together. Great looking build. Beautiful. Clean, well executed and polished. It's a really, really nice take. And I think also that white was a nice choice to be able to go with. Because the silver and white that goes with the Strix board really complemented the look and feel right there. 
Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and go to our next Builder Spotlight build. Um, let me see right here. Jin's asking a question. Uh, let me see right here. What is he saying? This might be up off topic. Uh, OC scanner. I'm following the recommended setting. So remember, if you're overclocking, right, um, using the OC scanner function, right, is attempting to scan essentially the range of the GPU. So it's not going to always be a guaranteed stability after you complete it, right? So you may actually have to go in and customize the voltage curve, right? to be able to actually tune the overclock accordingly, right? So what I would probably recommend first is maybe try the OC profile and see if the OC profile is stable. And then from there, you can attempt to go ahead and take that base VF curve, scan that VF curve, and attempt to go ahead and make slight adjustments to that VF curve um, step by step within a tight increment. Probably don't exceed um, probably about 15 megahertz base intervals, right? Um, to go ahead and see if you could go ahead and keep moving that value up. Hopefully that helps you there, okay? All right. And if you have more questions, feel free to go ahead and ask us in the uh, ASUS PCDIY group. All right. So next up, let's go ahead and get to a build that we didn't get to last week's. Um, and that's going to be from Mr. Matt, uh, Matthew Newell. Uh, so we go ahead and I think have a very cool uh, build right here. This is an ROG Evangelion based build that he did. And so I thought this turned out beautifully. So let's go ahead and get this one out. This one's Project Eva Flow. All right. All right. So uh, this looks, of course, just stunning. Um, Matt's a, also a great photographer. Um, so it's, it really brings a nice quality to, of course, his builds right there. But um, this just looks fantastic, right? Right on display. You can see that beautiful course graphics card that we have in terms of the ROG Evangelion base print. It has a really nice symmetry to go straight into the motherboard. Um, and I'm torn because I've seen this card in both the horizontal and the vertical, and I don't know which one I prefer. Um, the horizontal design has that really cool kind of waveform RGB design aesthetic that I think looks really cool. And then you still get to see that bottom portion of the motherboard, which I think looks really cool too. So it just has a little bit of a different vibe. I think this looks awesome though. So I'm not going to contend that saying it should have been one way or another way. I think it really looks fantastic. And it really just comes down to how you define the overall complete kind of look and feel for the system. But it's got a really polished, just beautiful execution right there. The cables are on point and perfectly line up with everything else where you've got the black with the purple, which just go perfect with the purple, which is present throughout there. Um, the AR fans, right, from NZXT are some of the oldest ARGB fans on the market. And I still think they're some of the absolute best looking fans because they bought in this really beautiful just diffusion ring, which is soft. It's not heavy. And it just provides some breathing room to be able to give a cool kind of smooth form um, to that actual ring and with a really nice sense of lighting. I love that he was really smart at doing kind of a zoned lighting. So take a look at this, right? It's all the details here that matter, right? Purple here, but then he went green up top to just give that contrast in the color blocking effect. And then we've got the purple and the green right there, which also again, add to that color blocking effect and go to tying in the rest of the overall look and feel. And it just is pulled off really, really well. Really, really great balance in terms of the overall color scheme. I love the way that this turned out and it just looks fantastic. And it's a great way to show off the ROG based Evangelion hardware, even though it's not all of our ROG hardware, right? It's not the Helios. It's not are uh, the Evangelion based cooler, but he has those core components in there and has them still feel all really holistic and come off really, really well in terms of the overall look and feel. So I love the way this turned out. It's a great looking build. Um, let's go ahead and just uh, look through some of these rest of these images right here. Great photos, great attention to detail. I love these color schemes. Here you can see what I was talking about that um, you have this beautiful little waveform RGB that you just don't see that. And even this cool little accent that looks really cool when you see it on the side profile, it has this really nice vibe to it. But again, the front looks really, really cool. So I'm, I'm torn. You could really kind of go either which way, right? Of course, the Berserk, that looks awesome right there. There's a little side profile. He also gave you a different GIF animation right there on the AO pump head. And then here, Throw it off to just, um, I know that our UK team sent them out some of the other components there to be able to put this together build. So um, this came out really cool where you can see, I really love this. This is the RG6 scope and the Curious. I think they look so cool. And then the RG Delta. Um, and then of course there, this, there's the matte 
really awesome, cool looking setup, right? Um, really, really cool. So um, feedback here is Michael gives us a definite thumbs up there. Wow. Uh, Sneff, he says, what a color theme. H2O Computers is giving us, yeah, the color scheme is on point. And Dev Trend says, yeah, it's definitely nice. Um, I would 100% agree. I think this turned out really, really well. Great looking build. So let's go ahead and pop back here. We'll leave it on that shot. Just a beautiful look for the overall system. I think it looks really great. And let's bring up here the submission form. So um, you guys can check them out. Mr. Matt Lee on Instagram, um, definitely. And let me go ahead and see here if I can just uh, go back here. Give me one second. Um, does the build have a theme? Of course, ROG Evangelion. Three words to describe it. Compelling, elegant, and dominant. Um, Project Eva Flow. And then in terms of the hardware, we've got an NZXT H7 Flow. Of course, this is, this is a 3080 Evangelion-based uh, graphics card. 12700K that's in there. That's all running on the Maximus Eva Z690 Hero board. And then we have... Um, Team Group's Delta Force, a 32 gigabyte DDR5 memory kit that's in there. And you can see only two DIMMs in there and it looks great, <laughs> right? Doesn't have to be four DIMMs, but you know, uh, to each his own, right? Uh, Crucial P5, one terabyte plus uh, PCIe. Uh, I think that's their Gen 4, Gen 4 uh, PCIe uh, NVMe based SSD. Um, then the cooler is the Z73. Um, Be Quiet Silent Wing actually is on the radiator fans. So those are actually not air fans. So these are the air fans, and then these are the Be Quiet fans. So it actually has two sets of fans that are in there. Uh, 1000 watt power supply in there, and then cable mods, mod flex cables. So custom cables from our friends over at Cable Mods. What was he most proud of? The coming together of the two brands, being able to bring together essentially NZXT, a lot of hardware in there, and then also being able to bring the Asus ROG Evangelion hardware all together uh, with, of course, his experience and his expertise to be able to pull off a cohesive look and feel, which I think he did 100%. It is on point. Anything you would change about the build? I like to have had the time to build a PTG custom loop uh, for the CPU inside with some select components from EK um, and then maybe go with a green or purple fluid. Sadly, the time with the components just didn't allow for it. I still think this looks fantastic. And then you would have lost out on this really cool kind of setup here with the this. And I would also say sometimes with the PTG, right, and the hard line, you would lose maybe sometimes the visibility for a lot of this right here and this, which I think looks so good. So it, I'm sure it would have looked fantastic, um, but it probably also would have had just a different look and feel, right? Um, took them about one day to build it, half a day to finalize, and then uh, you know just a little bit to be able to put in those personal touches. Um, the system was predominantly just for, of course, showcase um, and uh, being used for creativity and photo editing in mind, but also a bit of gaming, right? Um, for this build, he had to be that his favorite component uh, was the actual hero based motherboard, the new Polymo lighting display, which is this section right here. Uh, display switching between the characters was really unique and a welcome addition, man. Um, man, you hit it out of the park. It's a fantastic looking build, man. Thanks so much for sharing it. I'm going to go ahead and drop uh, his Instagram there in the chat if you guys want to check him out. Very, very cool. Definitely. And Sniff, the master himself, man, is giving you the light setup is perfect. I would agree. Great looking build. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our next one. All right. Let's see what we've got next here. Oh, I think next up, uh, we've got a very cool build. This is going to be from uh, SA Mod and Italian Extreme Modders. Um, some of the absolute best guys in the game, uh, Team IEM. And with their kind of attention to detail, their creativity, um, I think their execution when it comes to kind of look and feel is really top notch. If you guys are familiar with them, some of the absolute best builders and modders in the game. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at Project Lambo. Oh, wow. Very, very cool. So the first thing is, bam, you get that beautiful and bright metallic pearlescent green that just jumps out at you right and if you guys aren't familiar right uh, the, ins the inspiration here i think is the hirakon evo and the hirakon evo i think has a selvar's green which is their specific green which is this beautiful bright bold green that they have on terms of the car and you can see that that's present here and it just immediately gives you that vibe of kind of having that heritage to what you would see within a lamborghini right um on top of that this is the really cool part is that they took kind of a hybrid of taking kind of the essence of what's in ROG 
and in the Helios, but adapting it to fit with the vibe of what they want to do with Lamborghini and the Project Lambo. So the Helios normally has a full tempered glass panel right here, right? Um, and this is entirely different from the shroud, but you can see they pretty much customize this whole thing to have this hexagonal design that is replaced all there to have this kind of um, hexagonal um, kind of mesh design, which is what you would see kind of at the front of kind of Lamborghini for the front intake for the exhaust, right? And airflow. So it totally changes the look and feel um, uh, to this system that makes it really complement their original theme. So I love that they were able to go ahead and be able to really integrate the paint and the mod to the point that it seems like that. It seems like this is that this is the way that we sold the Helios, right? Except for the paint, right? The Helios comes like this with this mesh and it doesn't, right? So they had to custom implement this mesh here and in here and then this beautiful metallic paint it just looks absolutely stunning right um so let's go ahead and continue this little tour here of what we have we can see right here we've got a beautiful vertically oriented setup i love this nice beautiful pinstriping right here uh, we can see we've got an rg sticks graphics card in there vertically oriented um right and then we've also got these beautiful runs right here really nice just bends these are beautiful and i love that they're actually staggered if you notice these are not uh, perpendicular to each other. They're actually slightly offset, so they create a little bit of a depth perception, which is a really cool touch. Uh, just adds a little bit of depth and contrast to the way that you look at that. That's the sign of a pro, I think, at showing you that you're getting a little bit of a feel to it, not just having the same kind of aesthetic. Um, and the other cool thing is just really nice clean bends right here, so that's beautifully done. Um, I love the Elver color choice right here. Looks great. Of course, you have uh, the pump distro right there as well. Color scheme is great. We got the EK Vidar also with the green, which I think looks really, really good right there. And then from the top, they kept the handles. I love that they kept the handles on this. This is also a heavy system, so I think the handles make it easier to go ahead and move. Um, so totally makes sense on that side. And then with the lighting, the lighting just takes it up a notch. It's cool. It definitely gives it that kind of nice level of additional kind of contrast and fill and just a little bit of a brighter vibe. You can see it interestingly, it immediately adds a little bit of luminosity to the actual uh, runs. So it gives it a really kind of look and feel uh, to it. Uh, let's see. So some feedback here. Suman says, nice Helios. I love uh, I love these uh, these paints, Jan. Yes, uh, Snef saying uh, Porsches versus Lamborghini. Yeah, so Harji versus Team IM, right, right here. Uh, <laughs> um, great paint, uh, great mod and paint on the Helios. I would definitely agree with that. Very well done. Uh, love the green and the unique bend setup. Yeah, definitely. These really, really nicely done. And I love uh, this nice white to go there. It immediately is a great just kind of complement to the black and the green. And I love right here, as you see the angle, you get a little bit more that's kind of going on there with just that white right there. So you get the white fans that are also there, there. And then that white just also on the ROG Thor helps to kind of tie in together a little bit of that contrast and that lighting and all these different zones to give you a nice bold. And even right here, you can see the lighting on the top of the card, right, um, in that vertical orientation. Love the uh, choice here on the cabling, right? perfectly complements it. That just looks fantastic. It looks like it's designed for speed and performance, right? It's like it it's evocative of the Huracan Evo. So it definitely is doing its name justice right there. And you can see, right, of course, the uh, enemy matrix display that's on there. It's the same, looks like the same board that we've got right here. Some Patriot DDR5 memory that's on there. And then, of course, you've got the EK block all lit up there too. Beautiful looking. Really nice job on the cable routing. The cable routing super clean and on point. I mean, it's all just super tightly uh, run in there. It's beautifully executed. And there you can see that Thor just kind of shining through, but through that grill, it's like, mm, it's ready to just vroom, right? <laughs> That's beautiful looking. And then on that back, this rear just looks, this looks gorgeous too. And look, look at that paint, that pearlescent metallic. It just looks gorgeous. fantastic looking build and mod and that's the thing is you almost can't even tell that it's a build mod right because of how clean the mod execution is i don't even know where to leave it at uh word to word i leave that at that that one that one's a pretty awesome shot right there so let's go ahead and leave it at that 
I think that actually uh, he we didn't actually get in a full submission form from there. They actually just sent me over the images. Um, but uh, you guys can definitely go ahead. And I think that there is um, a video here that you guys can go ahead and check out. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if that's up there. Ah, uh, yes, we got a video right here. Very cool. Okay, so I will drop that in the chat right there. I think I do have actually, uh, hold on, some notes right here that I have to confirm, I think, on the core hardware. Yeah, okay, cool. I have that information. So let me go ahead and uh, just bring this up right here. Okay, so yeah, you guys can check this uh, little video out there. We're going to throw it. We know we've already got them a sub. So throw them guys a sub, some of the best models and builders in the game. We're going to throw them a like right there. Look at that very cool system. Uh, let me go ahead and just bring up my notes right here. So this is a 12700K that's in there. That's on the Maximus uh, C690 Hero board. It's a 30, uh, 3070 base Strix graphics card in there. That's the Patriot Venom Viper uh, DDR5-6200. That's a beastly kit of memory. CL40. Um, it's in the customized Helios. 1,000-watt power supply, our ROG Thor version 2. Um, the VP4300 M.2 SSD from Patriot as well. That drive is supremely fast. Monster drive. EKWB custom loop that's in there. Um, pretty much top to bottom, right? We've got the Velocity in there, the Kinetic, uh, the PE360, uh, the X3M in there, the Torx fittings, right? And then also Cryo Full Pro Mix with a transparent liquid coolant, uh, Reaper cables uh, for it uh, as well, as well uh, that are in there in the configuration. So overall, man, fantastic build from them. It's great looking. Love the way that it turned out. Very cool build. All right, guys. Uh, let's go ahead and see what we got next right here. All right. I think we can go ahead and I can squeeze them. I can squeeze them in. Let's let's squeeze them, the remainder in. All right. We've got Void Mark from the Armands. All right. We'll go ahead and get his submission form in here and then we've got one other build here from uh, the one the only snef that we're going to also touch on to wrap up the stream i think that's fitting we'll wrap it up with snef uh, the master himself all right uh let's go ahead and show you what we got here from void mark all right oh very cool very interesting uh we have continuing in that kind of that custom paint and kind of vibe that we have there very very cool Right where we've got again a little bit of kind of chameleon, almost pearlescent type of metallic type of paint going on. We've got gold making another uh, kind of uh, um, excuse me, uh, making its way into this build as well in terms of the fittings. I really love that way that this colors plays out. Now this is interesting because I think maybe the lighting isn't hundred percent actually doing this picture as good as it does. I think actually having a little bit more contrast, a little bit away from some of the sunlight actually would have showed you the depthness, the depth and the richness in this type of color. I think this color works best when it has a little bit more kind of uh, darkness at play as opposed to light harshly kind of shining on it. But it's still a cool, definitely scenario. This environment is beautiful. And here we can see some really great runs right here with some really interesting layout choices, right? Where we've got dual kind of setup, right? Where we have one color scheme with the white and then we've got another right and then along with them the gold so this is really really interesting oh this is really cool i love i love this pearlescence this pearlescence is really kind of cool this chameleon kind of vibe that's in there we can see the board in there this is a really interesting mount situation here too that we have for um kind of this distro with the pump integration i don't know that i've ever seen somebody do it like this and have this kind of dual zone space it makes for some really interesting kind of blocking that occurs within the layout and the look and feel but these bends right up here are really really nicely done and really creative and i love seeing a little bit more kind of a variation in terms of kind of the approach to these runs as opposed to kind of going with something like in a distro where you just have a lot of perpendicular runs i like seeing kind of something purposefully being executed in here and having a little bit more kind of a focus to create a certain void um, excuse me, a certain kind of look and feel um, uh, that is in this void mark build. Oh, that's really cool. Interesting kind of front front facade right there. 
very interesting in terms of the front facade. Really nice bend over here. Another nice clean bend right there. Interesting. We got G Skill Royals in there. I hopefully you have a shot there lit up. I'd love to see a shot with it. And here, this is a great I, way that we can actually see um, the actual kind of uh, chameleon effect, right? Where you can see before we had kind of a purple vibe, and now we have almost more like a teal uh, color scheme that's in there. So it's really, really interesting. And then you can see how the white plays with that teal and gives you kind of an interesting color scheme. Oh, there we go. Very, very cool. This is a really interesting, uh, really interesting build. Really creative in terms, I think, the approach to kind of the runs and the layout that we have here. Sneff gives it a great tube run. I like it a lot. I, I think it's really creative. I think it takes actually some really conscious effort. It's sometimes a lot easier to just kind of use a distro and just run these perpendicular lines. But to think about being kind of creative and really kind of playing around with... Um, you know, your runs and where you're going to route them. And then even do, thinking about things like this, where like you've got dual color schemes at play and how you want colors to play into it. I think that's really, really cool. So I give them a lot of, a lot of credit right here that there's a lot of creativity in terms of trying something out. That's really cool. So let's go ahead and take a look. So this is from the Armands. Uh, it's not their first build. Um, does the build have a theme? The case is paired with a chameleon color, turquoise and silver, which later can be peeled off like a sticker. Interesting. Oh, actually, I think I could maybe tell that a little bit down here, right? So you can actually maybe see like this little area right there. It's almost like you could peel it off. So uh, it's interesting. I wonder how long that would run right there as far as, uh, well, it's durability, I guess, right? Three words to describe the build, color transition, vibrant, and heavy. <laughs> I could definitely see where all those things come into play. And I definitely think it hits the nail on the head there. Uh, Void Shark is the name of the build. Uh, core components right there is we have an uh, ROG Strix X570-E gaming. And then also there's an ROG, actually Thor 850 watt power supply in there. Um, I don't have a link to the full specifications in there. So I don't know what the Ryzen base CPU is in there. I know those are uh, G-Skill Trident Royal Z series um, as far as in there. And we also know that we've got some EK water cooling hardware in there. There's no defined budget. Um, the aspect that he was most pr proud of is the overall color scheme. I actually, I would be, I think for me, the color is really cool, but I'm most actually... I think where the credit is, is in the creativity in terms of these runs and layouts to go with something that's just different. It's not traditional, right? Um, and so I give a lot of credit there. About three weeks to put it all together. Um, it's predominantly used for gaming, Final Fantasy, uh, Witcher 3, and World of Warcraft. Um, he goes, I'm in love with the ROG Thor PSU. I would never sell or change it for anything else. Um, that's really nice to know, especially you can't even see the Thor power supply in there, right? Because it's entirely blocked off from the PSU shroud. But overall, a really cool build, man. I give you a thumbs up. Um, it's got a really cool distinctive design to it. And it's nice to be able to see this creativity. And I really also like the approach of having a little bit of a color blocking in play there. Michael gives it that the weathered industrial looking portions work well. Yeah, I would definitely agree. All right. So let's go ahead and wrap this up, guys. And let's go with our last build here. Uh, we've got one from Sneff. Um, and if you guys didn't see it, it's an absolute stunning build. Uh, this is going to be, uh, I think here, uh, his uh, mini ITX based build, right? That was featuring the Meshalicious. And so... Let's go ahead and take a closer look at this one. This one's a fantastic a looking build. So right off the bat, we can see right here, we've got something that's really cool. And I went back and I actually captured some other pictures they didn't send over to me because I thought it was so cool, again, to just show off his kind of creativity and his ingenuity, uh, the skill and the kind of the experience that he brings to his client builds, right? Um, we've got an ROG Strix Dash I board, and this is not a white motherboard, he painted it, right? Um, but Hearst, as always, it looks fantastic. So let's go ahead and keep evolving it. And then right there, we can see we've got this beautiful looking just aesthetic right here where here you can, of course, this is entirely custom, right? Where we have a custom distro uh, that's been implemented right there. And it also, I love, what I really love right here is the, pl the play that we have with some depth and dimension, right? So we have almost a top layer here, then there's a second layer here, and then there's a third layer here. 
So that actually your eye has a little bit of difference in texture, right? This is similar to what we saw in the uh, Team IEM build, right? And even what we saw in the build before where you're giving your eye kind of relief where it doesn't feel all flat when you can kind of go to different things, it creates a sense of texture and depth, which is really cool. Um, loving just the cohesive of the color scheme, right? Having all those kind of whites play in really closely together, having the silvers, having the blacks, the tones just look fantastic in there. They just look really, really, really great. Um, just beautiful looking. I love this too. Look at this. Uh, I don't, um, I'm, Correct me if I'm wrong, if Snef, you're still here, right? But I don't think that these come standard with the Mesh Delicious. I think you added these, but it's beautiful to be able to see these custom feet right here. I think they look great. Fantastic. And so right here, oh man, I need to get one of these. Look at that, that beautiful just case badge. But right here, you can see the custom work that he did in terms of this really cool layered pattern. So you've got looks like a circle and then you've got like kind of this little star that just looks really, really cool in terms of just a design that I think looks fantastic. Now, I don't want to show you guys the light up yet perspective because the light up perspective, I think, looks really, really cool. But then here you kind of see the front uh, perspective. They're oh, that's so cool. Those are turntable feet. That's a really cool kind of hack and mod, right? Um, but here you can beautifully see the black the white right there, just all how that just looks so cleanly integrated. I love then the, the black also where, you know, these screws, you didn't go with like silver or black. You can keep this kind of like inverse kind of panda vibe that you have going on there. It looks really, really, really nice. And I love that you just have such a different perspective from the front to the side, right? They have just different vibes. And so you have a really great looking distinct front ID. And then on the side, you have entirely different kind of ID. And then on the other side, you can see in there are the graphics card, which is also white. And then just more of that beautiful custom panel that has designed there to really be able to give it a really kind of cool, kind of frosted diffused aesthetic with a layered look, right? It's just, this turned out just stunning. It's just, it's a fantastic build that just brings a huge amount of attention to detail. So now let's go ahead and take a look here. Let's go and let's light it up because it looks fantastic as it is right there, right? But now let's light it up, right? And then here, it just takes it to the next level, right? I love the way that this lighting came out. It has such a nice soft diffused le level to it that it's really warm and inviting. The colors go beautifully with this build and they really complement the tendency of white to be able to reflect the color scheme just lightly throughout the rest of the body. And I think that just looks fantastic. I really love the way that this turned out at having um, the white be present still throughout the look and feel but then have this underglow of lighting. It almost has like an ethereal feel. Or if you've seen some creatures like jellyfish that are in the ocean, which have this really beautiful kind of soft diffused lighting internally, but then they still have this greater kind of white color scheme. It looks beautiful and just really, really nice diffused lighting. Maybe one of my favorite RGB implementations I might've maybe ever seen. Um, it's really, really uh, nicely done. And I love this, this soft lighting that you can see that, you have it right here on the diffused distro, but then how that goes in and reflects on the top of the white portion of the motherboard and the block, just a little bit of that lighting just looks beautiful, it looks great. And then right here, an alternate color scheme. And I'm always a big fan of this color blocking to be able to have one color and then another color, which reinforces actually the colors because your brain is going and thinking one color, but then it has to pick up another color. So you got these kind of teal and green, and then you've got kind of these pink and purples, right, that are in there, and even a little bit of blues in there. They just look beautiful, right? And you look at the front, and then just look at the front. Look how that also then brings that in. Really, really pretty, right? Again, right here. Oh, hey, Erica's giving us. Oh, man, that's awesome. Uh, she really loves the color scheme. I agree. I think it looks great right here. This little co soft colors, and I love the way that this lighting played out right here. And then you see that soft kind of color that also is then there on the side. I love the how it just has that little bit of a additional color scheme. And then on the other side where the graphics card is, right, you can see that you've got more of that lighting just kind of coming through a little bit and it just looks fantastic. So it's beautifully done. I don't even know which like kind of image to leave it on. It just looks great. Um, before we kind of go into giving the details here though, I do want to just lastly show here some extra just images that I pulled up that I wanted you guys to see um, some of the other work, which I thought was great here to be able to show off. So just let me show this to you here, because 
uh, Snef doesn't ever show, he doesn't ever send me the pictures of the design work, but I think like this is equally as important to show off. So um, you can see right here, really cool. So here you can see, you know, working through and getting it all set up. And that's the graphics card, right? Here's the graphics card in there. That's our tough gaming graphics card. And there's the motherboard. But you saw the both the motherboard and the graphics card. Guess what? So let's take a look at the motherboard in white. So we can see right there, right? Uh, excuse me, motherboard, original, SNEF edition. That's what it's going to call. I'm calling it the SNEF edition because that's what it is, right? It's the SNEF edition, right? So you can see uh, the attention to detail and just how the quality of just this paint. It looks like we produced it, right? It looks like it came from the factory in white, right? Um, beautifully done. And then... Uh, here for the graphics card, you can see the original. And then again, we can go over here and we can see the graphics card also in white, right? Beautifully done right there as well. Here you can see, of course, uh, the mocking up in the development, right? For the custom, um, uh, excuse me, distro, right? Before it actually got completed. And then look at uh, just integrating that beautiful look in all that space, right? At just how tight it all is in there, right? He had to pack everything in there really cleanly, really nicely integrated, right? Um, that is the benefit of the Mesh Delicious. It's, it's a well-balanced case. It's got a good amount of space still to be able to route the, kind of the cables in there um, and give you a little bit of flexibility, even though it's still quite compact. And then he really used that vertical space really, really well, right? So overall, I mean, again, we go back to, of course, the final form. And then we go back here and you can just see just how this turned into just a stunning build, right? Um, just fantastic. So uh, let me go ahead and I think bring up his submission form right here uh, to see what we've got in terms of just some feedback. So we've got uh, H2O Computers, time for the demand. I would definitely agree. Uh, an absolute masterclass builder brings another masterpiece here. Uh, Vitor gives it uh, hard eyes. I would definitely agree. Love this one. Uh, so much great work. Um, I love this one. Very cool. Play Pinko while it boots up. I like that. Sue Man gives us always a work of art. I love these builds, right? Um, the custom work is out of this world, right? The hues is outstanding, Mythic Fog. And actually, I think he said it wasn't, right? Um, I think Snef said, let me see right here. Ace Jeep gives us a great build. He said, no, it is cryofuel solid white. So that's actually the really good thing, what I was saying, right? Is that he just kept it all white and it's the RGB lighting just naturally playing with that base, right? Um, so yeah, 3090 Ti, and he was able to fit it in there, albeit very tight. Yeah, that's a big graphics card. It's one of the biggest graphics cards on the market, just the, the massive size that we have in terms of the cooler uh, to be able to fit it in there. But overall, really impressive. It's a fantastic build. Uh, let me see. I think I've got the submission form. Let me go ahead and bring that up really quickly here. Um, yep, I've got his submission form. So let me just go ahead and bring that right there. So we'll bring up our image back again. I'm going to leave it on that one because I just love the way that one looks right there. And we will see right here. So, of course, this is from Sniff Computer Design. You guys, if you haven't, make sure to go ahead and check out his Facebook, his, his Instagram, right? Um, Sniff always documents his builds uh, for his clients and that he does with other uh, partners and, and everything else. So it's a great feed if you just want to be able to see a lot of really creative inspiration in terms of kind of PC DIY. Um, no theme. It was just made. Uh, it was the build was made for the living room environment. And the focus was to kind of keep it just all white and black, which you can see when it's not in that RGB vibe, right? It's 100% just in that white and the black vibe looks beautiful, right? In that kind of aesthetic right there. Three words to describe the build is very compact, but still powerful and have a clean design. 100% agree. Really clean, polished, beautifully executed, of course, with a great overall design aesthetic, right? And I think a really distinct kind of geometry that's also in here. I think this is really creative. I've never seen Sneff do something like this, but it's very evocative of so much of the other work that he's done. I, I actually get a lot of symmetry this to, I think, one of the previous ones, the Egyptian mods uh, that he did where he had really interesting kind of glyphs in there. So, uh, you know, he can really do it all, right, when it goes to having stuff that's really simple to also stuff that is ornate, um, kind of cuts across all different types of designs here. 
Um, does the build have a name? No name. Core hardware in here. We have a 12900K. This is a Z690-I motherboard that, of course, got painted white. Then a tough RTX 3090 that was also painted white. 32 gigabytes of memory that's in there. 6000 MT. That's awesome. Of course, mini ITX. It's only two slot board, so that's perfect to be able to run high, um, uh, high frequency DDR5 memory kit in there. Also a Team Force uh, Z4Q Gen 4 4 terabyte. Uh, drive in there. So lots of storage with a high performance PCIe NVMe SSD and SFX 1000 watt power supply from Silverstone. That's a beastly based power supply. And this is all inside the Meshalicious white along with their Gen 4 riser cable. Um, all EK water cooling hardware except for the pump. And then of course the custom panel and the distro are by Sneff himself. That's uh, you know really what is elevating this look and feel because he was of course able to produce those items himself. And then of course tons of just subtle details that he brings in to elevate the build. Total build was about $8,000. Uh, he was most proud of how the overall custom grill, the panel, and the distro got implemented. And I would agree. They really just elevate the look and feel. If this was just a standard Meshalicious and he had painted it white, it'd still look fantastic and it would still be a featured build. But just then taking it to the next level with the distro and that um, custom panel, I think, looked fantastic. Nothing would change about the build. And I agree. I don't think I would change anything at all. I think it looks really stunning. Um, time of work with the design in Fusion 360, the paint and the build, and then of course the fabrication, about 50 to 60, uh, I'm assuming days uh, is the time frame as a definite undertaking. And it's being used as an HTPC for gaming and VR um, as far as the primary focus for the client. Um, he was really, really actually happy to be able to try out the vertical layout of the M.2 on the Z690-i. So that's the design that's on here, as well as the sound card on the board, and then the simplicity of the actual data board design uh, that's on the Z690-i. So overall, um, it is a stunning build and a great way to be able to wrap up the PC Web Builder Spotlight. Um, so guys, that wraps up the stream for today. And Snef, thanks so much again for uh, sending over and submitting that build. It's truly a stunning build and was fantastic to be able to show it. And thanks to everybody that submitted their PC DIY build. So with that, guys, if you guys are going to be enjoying a long weekend, please stay safe, stay healthy, um, take care of yourselves, enjoy some time off, and take care and take it easy. And if we see you in the PC DIY group, I'll see you there. So as always, take care, take it easy, and enjoy the rest of your day. Best of luck with your guys' build, upgrades, or whatever it might be. See you guys next week. Take care.